relate. Whoever wanted reality check. list uh that's me marking your name off the house list you're in there and today's episode is a special one to be in for i'm telling you first thank you for tuning in for listening if you're listening on itunes and you haven't already please subscribe to the podcast that way you get prompts i usually try to post these late at night on tuesday and eastern standard time I've been looking at the data. I think uh, we got a healthy amount of people on the East Coast, a healthy amount of people on the West Coast, but then there's also people, thankfully, if you're listening, overseas. So if you're in Europe or the UK, I've been noticing uh, some pockets bubbling up here and there. I try to get it at a certain time so you get it at, at each time. And hopefully you can listen to it on your commute to work or during the morning or daytime, but really pick and choose when you like. Because this conversation here with my very special guest today is an epic one. It's the longest one I've done to this date in its entirety. Um, my guest today is none other than producer, visual artist, world touring DJ, Geology. Yes, my man, Geology. So we talked a couple days ago. I actually just got up and walked over from my house over to his house where we're neighbors actually which is incredible because he's one of the very few neighbors I know in my neighborhood and it just happens to be that uh, I've known him for quite a while quite a long time uh, some of you may know that I released an album of his in 2005 yes on my defunct label female fun records if you picked it up back then thank you I appreciate it it was called geology plays geology which was like a career retrospective of, of a bunch of uh, production work he had done up to that point, and lots of unreleased material. It's great. It's a great vibe. Seek it out. You can still find it here and there. Um, so I've been knowing him for a long time. Also, we have a connection through DJ Spinna, another great producer DJ based here in New York, because that instrumental composition that opened the podcast today was a track from the Jig Masters group, which Spinna is a member of with Krim, shouts to Krim, Criminal, um, from their debut full length of 2001 called Infectious, but that was a song that Geology produced, an album closer uh, called Reality Check that I always loved and I wanted to um, uh, showcase an older piece of production at the beginning because at the very end of the of the podcast i drop a a new joint that people haven't heard that um uh, is a nice representation of his evolution um as a producer now many people know geology as a music producer um but he is much more than that he's a visual artist a painter uh he went to to sva here in new york city um, he went to art school in uh, growing up in Baltimore, where he's from originally. In fact, his schoolmate was none other than Tupac Shakur. They had a group together uh, in which they even recorded some raw stuff as, as teenagers in high school called Born Busy. That's the name of the group. That was Tupac's first uh, uh, ever recorded experience was done with geology. So we and we go into that. We go into his work as a visual artist um, and his uh, time working with Matt Dew and Doable Arts. And if you're familiar with what Doable Arts is or who Matt Matt Dew is, um, and 
and geology or G. Young as he went um, in that uh, uh, formation. We go really deep into that and it's, it's revealing, it's, it's honest, it's real. In fact, uh, many of you may know if you're a record collector or a hip hop record collector, you know their work, it, um, both as a team and as um, solo artists. Uh, uh, for geology, he he did uh, the body rock, uh, the original artwork for body rock, the single from Most Def that had Q-tip and Tash on it. It's an incredible portrait, uh, but it's mixed media, a classic example of his work, and we break it down in our conversation. So that's later on in the talk. Um, it's a great way to 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 imagine it because it's audio only and these guys were incredible i mean as far as doing what they did without the use of computers a mixed media of acrylic and ink and um, photo flipping photocopies and cut and paste and photography it's it's absolutely mind-blowing and we went through his book and um there's a lot of record covers and album covers done by both of them uh, Matt Dew, of course, is is known in, in circles as the 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 man who created the the original artwork for Organized Confusion's second album, Stress: The Extinction Agenda. And if you know that cover, you know what an incredible piece of of artwork that is. If you don't, I, I advise you looking that up and looking up the Body Rock cover, and then you may start to see how many other things they did. It's it's inc it's incredible. There's a lot of other stuff, and I could sit here and and explain it all for for you but you might need to do a little digging uh, but we go deep and that's my man and we had a great conversation a long conversation in fact we had already talked like an hour before we started doing this so it's an epic three-hour chat take your time with it listen to it however you may i hope you enjoy it please remember to uh, subscribe on itunes subscribe on soundcloud if you're listening in either format just do me a favor and, and, and either repost it or tweet about it or, or, or just copy and send it to a friend or something like that you, that might be a fan of geology or might be into uh, design work. Just, I'm just, you know, help me get the word out, you know? That's all I ask. I appreciate it. I do this. Nobody's getting paid for this, you know, but we spend a lot of time, myself, CJ Stewart, who helps edit and engineer and, and tweak the levels and he's in California. We're not even doing recording this stuff together. There's no studio. It's DIY as it gets, and that's the way I like it. Uh, I, not to say I will, I will uh, uh, be happy to have some nice mics eventually, and we'll get there. But before all that, I want you here checked out this conversation with my man, Geology, here on the house list. Check it out. Thank you. Thankfully, we live pretty close to each other, so yeah. that works out. Which is great. Still, like you know still like unbelievable to me but yeah because i remember coming here to this apartment um like one of the very first times i think i even met you or we we were hung out at least yeah. and that was over 10 years ago for sure yeah, much longer than yeah. that i think it's kind of crazy because now after like 2010 or something the years just seem to all kind of like be yeah. jumbled into one i yeah. feel like once you get once we got past 2010 there's no distinction between 2016 and 2011 or mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. i mean that's how it feels to me but it's, you've held this place down for for a while yeah. um but you know i'm i'm curious because i met you when you had already moved here but you'd been living mm -hmm. in new york um already for a while before you moved out to brooklyn and we're in park slope right now but so when when did you when did you come up from Baltimore where you grew up to New York? Um, 80, 88 Nice was the year. Um, yeah, it was um, eighty eight was the year that I I moved here. And it, um, and and I know that you know obviously uh, uh, for a few different reasons. But did you were you immediately attending or going to SVA? At that time, um, I was about to be going there. Um, I had already graduated high school, um, Baltimore School for the Arts, it was the art high school, um, and I came up at, like immediately after that and was here for the summer. Um, oh, nice! Before uh, before I started, you know, 
the college program. So, so you were born and raised in Baltimore, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was born in Baltimore, and then you know came here. They didn't call it the DMV back then. Nah, <laughs> I, I never as as a Virginia native myself too. <laughs> It's never a term I never really like totally like settled into, you know, I guess it makes sense because we're all connected, D.C., Maryland and Virginia. But um, yeah, I don't know. It's so funny because it felt like to me, Virginia always felt far <laughs> when I was in Baltimore. Yeah. You know, you know I never really realized, um, you know, like the vicinity was not so far. It depends on where you where yeah. you live at in Maryland, I guess. And where you're at in Virginia. I mean, I grew yeah. up in southwest Virginia, yeah. so it's like really yeah. closer to Tennessee and North Carolina. Because my idea of Virginia is like, you know, I, we used to go to King's Dominion and stuff right. like That's that. Right, that's Williamsburg. Virginia. You know, and, um, and it always felt like a long drive to get there. Um, that was the um, field trip spot. I think everywhere in Virginia, D.C., Maryland was King's Dominion and <laughs> uh, and um, like historic uh, Williamsburg. And yeah, it was before they before Six Flags popped up in Maryland. I guess. Oh and right, came mm-hmm. in later. But um, but yeah, but back in the old school days, yeah, King's Dominion was the was the spot. And um, yeah, I re- I remember um a time that well I'll be jumping ahead, but you that's know, all right. But like a time that um, you know, back in high school, you know, Tupac and I went to high school together, and Jada Pinkett and or Jada Pinkett Smith, as you all know her now, mm-hmm. um, we all went to school together, the Baltimore School for the Arts. But um, so Pac, myself, um, my friend Darren, who also went to the school, and um, and and Pac's friend um, Dana, um, we all became a group. And um, but Dana didn't go to school with us, um, so there was one point in time, you know, we used to have like um, like practice, you know, and just like as a group, like work on music stuff or whatever. Like at different people's homes? No, no, it was at my crib. Oh yeah, you know, we okay. always come to my crib and record and stuff like that. Um, so um, one time, Pac disappeared, and me and Darren, we couldn't find him, and. You know, no one knew where he was and whatever, but he was supposed to be over at the crib, you know, we were supposed to be working on some music or whatever. And, um, but we ended up finding out later that at that time that, that Tupac and Jada had went off to King's Dominion <laughs> one day. Oh, wow. Which was very ironic because, um, they, while they were there, they recorded, um, Something in the you know how they have like a recording booth for right, a song, right? And I I believe that um, Tupac was rapping one of Will Smith's songs. Shut up, man! You know, and Jada has this on 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 um, video. She has it, so um, you know. Um, but yeah, it's it's so crazy that Pac is actually doing like a a, a Fresh Prince and Jazzy Jeff. That's song. crazy. You know, he's rapping it and it their own video. And stuff like that, doing it. And, That's wild. Um, and you know, so yeah, so they end up bringing it to the crib. Oh wow! You know, so after they, you know, they made it to my parents' house by the night, by that evening. You know, so we're all there. So it's me, Jada, um, Pac, Darren, and Jada. I mean, yeah, me, Jada, Darren, Pac. Um, I don't know if Dana, Dana was there, and I think Dana didn't come by that night. But um, but yeah, but but Pac showed us. They showed us the video. We was like laughing, <laughs> watching it, you know. And it's so funny because like years later, because I remember that situation, and years later, somehow you remember when um Keenan Ivy Ivy Wayans had um he had his um a talk show. He had a talk show. Yeah, I do yeah. remember that. Yeah. So he had Jada on there as a guest. You know, they were friends too. Um, he somehow got his hands on that video and sh- and showed it on the show wow. when, when she was a guest on there. And I was laughing because it was the first time I saw it since the time that she brought it to the crib after they just recorded it. Wow. Because that must have been shot with like the big old like VHS uh, like recorder type of camcorder back then. Right? Whatever whatever they had inside that booth. Right. Like, oh, that, right, right. They filmed it in the booth. Right, like, right. At King's Dominion. So... Um, yeah, oh, that's a trip. So they gave it to them on tape. So right, and they brought it over, and, and we, you know, we played it. So it was funny to see that on on TV because it was like, yo, that's my history. Like I remember the day that they filmed that, 
and you know pocket disappeared we didn't know where the fuck he was at right. you know what i'm saying and and they both show up like oh we we're coming you know and they went to king's dominion and didn't tell them tell anyone so wow um but yeah it's very very funny what was that what was that high school like what was that experience uh you know obviously there is a lot of other creative people there it's a it's a it's an art specific school right so yeah yeah it's a performing arts school um with a visual arts department a music department a dance department and a theater department um and you were strictly interested in in the visual arts or were you were you at that when you're that young you're kind of dabbling in everything right or? i mean the question you're asking is it's it's kind of like a um complicated question to answer okay. um at the school i mean i'll break it down like this at the school you have to just be in your field. You have to just oh, okay. be in your field. But you're asking me my interest. My interest is never just strictly anything. My interest is all over the place. You know, I have right. so in music and art has always been equal interest to me. You know, but I'm also interested in other things as well. Um, but at the school, basically, I had to. You had to. You had to audition to get in the school, and you couldn't just go to the school like because you want to go to school you have to actually make it in and make the cut to get into the school and at that time the school was quite small it's grown a lot now um it's bigger now they have they have extra buildings and stuff that's a part of the school now and they've made you know they've they've gotten made a lot of money over the years and people have um raised money for the school so now it's grown and expanded but at that time that was a really small amount of students they would allow in each year. So it wasn't an easy school to get into. Um, but I auditioned for music and I auditioned for for visual arts separately. Oh. You know, so I auditioned for both. Um, and I, Do you remember that? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, for music, I, I auditioned playing my trumpet. And, oh, um, and then on the, on the visual arts side, you know, I, I came in doing visual arts. So basically, um, you know, I, I, I got the news that I, I made it into the school. I could go in. I, I made it in to, from the art side and the, the also from the, the music side. Mm. So I was assuming that, okay, maybe I could do both. You know, that's what I was trying to say. You know, I made it in for both. Why can't I do both? But they were like, no, you can't. You only can choose one. You have to only choose mm. one field, you know, and um, so, so you know, I chose the visual arts because you know I wasn't as passionate about playing the trumpet, you know. Um, just to give you some background on the trumpet, I started playing the trumpet when I was probably like nine years old, I believe. Right. Um, and um, actually, it first started before I played the trumpet. I started with the cornet, you know, which is kind of like a similar to a trumpet, you right? Know, it's, you know, it's a little smaller. Um, and then the cornet transferred me to the trumpet. Um, and then there was a certain point in time, I think some years into it that, um, cause I had the school's trumpet, you know, it was like a trumpet from the school. Oh, and right. It, a loner. And it got, yeah. And it got stolen. You know, my school was in the hood. I was in a, um, um, PS 101, um, in Baltimore. So, um, you know, it's kind of like East Baltimore. Like if you if you think about the wire, and yeah. you think about like um, Prop Joe's territory was on the east side. That would have been where my school was in oh, his wow. area. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So um, you, you're talking like um, you know Biddle, Wolf Street, Washington, Chase. You know, right in that area. So anyway, um, the school was real right near where the, the train trussle is. Like we're basically the Amtrak train that goes that comes down from New York, the Northwest Cor- Corridor right. train that goes from DC to Boston. Um ride right over the school. So every time I would oh, I would wow. come in from New York back to Baltimore or go back to New York from Baltimore, I passed by my elementary school where mm-hmm. I was at that time, one on one. So um, when I was there, um, the Trump, one of the, some instruments got, you know, the school got broken into, someone stole the in- instruments and happened to have stole my trumpet. So at that time they had me, they gave me a, a loaner instrument, but the only other instrument they had that they could give me um, was a trombone. So I started to play the trombone oh, wow. for a yeah, while. That was my instrument as well. For a temporary time until I got a new trumpet. And eventually we 
my parents bought me a trumpet, so I, I, I own a trumpet, you know, so. You still got it? Yeah, I still got it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I ain't playing it. <laughs> I lost my chops, you know. Trumpet is one of them instruments that you got to, like, you got to stay on it, man, because it's, it's, it's exercise with, with the muscles and your breathing, and, you know, it, 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 it takes a lot of um, practice and a, oh, yeah. a lot of um, constant you yeah, know, you gotta stay dedication, on it. commitment, you, you all gotta, that. You gotta stay on it, and uh, yeah. So I lost my chops with that long ago. <laughs> so <laughs> you don't want me picking up the trumpet right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh. <laughs> but anyway, so yeah, so basically that is that history. So um, as I was playing that instrument, you know, I played. I played in bands. I played solo performances. I mean, I, I did a lot of performing. You know, but at that time I wasn't writing my own music. I was right. performing. I was reading music and and yeah. And, I mean, you're a kid and, too. And just, right? Yeah, and just playing. You know, but you know, like I said, I started that probably at the age I think it was nine. Um, by eleven, I started to DJ. So what? So, so do you remember uh, getting those turntables? Like, what was what was that like? When? How did that? come about how did you piece that together or come across records and all that was there must have been records in the house well, uh, well i mean i first had my earliest record i got at the age of five so i mean i had my own records already right way before then um so um you know my family i grew up in a household of you know my dad collected a lot of music and records even to this day he still has a lot of records and music um i mean i i've surpassed him as far as records and stuff are concerned but he still has a lot of music <clears throat> um and my my uncle wasn't living with us at that time but he also was had a lot of records and a lot of music as well um all of my family my grandmother had records my aunt had records like you know i grew up with our family just had music, right. you know, so I, I was around a lot of music. Um, so basically, um, you know, when so all right, this is this is what happened. Um, back at that school I was telling you about, the elementary school, um, we used to do these candy drives where you basically you try to sell candy bars, and whoever gets the number one prize gets the you know gets the big gift. So I think one year the big prize was a, a trip to 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 um Disney World. Oh okay. You know, in in Florida. So um so basically my dad really was the one who who was selling selling it for me. Like he would take it to work and, and you know and oh, right. he would just sell like we was out selling everybody with the amount of <laughs> sales. So basically but this is this was like my this is my first lesson as as a kid about knowing how to, to keep your mouth shut. So um, this is a really early lesson I learned as a, as a really young kid. Um, so I came to the school, and I knew that I had a, you know I just knew I felt that yeah we were gonna win this we were gonna <laughs> right. win this because I'm like nobody's parents was gonna like outsell the amount of candy that hmm. we were selling you know and. And especially at that school, it was just like, you know, the school was real, man. Like, there's a lot of kids there that didn't have parents. You know, they may have only had one parent or their parents are in the street, you know, addicted to, you know, drugs and, and alcohol or, you know, some, some kids were pretty much raising themselves or living with their grandparents who were too old to really right. take care of them. So, you know, it was like not everybody's situation you know, what a lot of people didn't have a situation like mine, you know. So, you know, I I you know, I was fortunate for, you know, to have like, you know, my both my, my mom and my dad and you know, my grandmother was also a teacher at that school too. Oh, okay. You know. Um but um so anyway, but going back to my lesson, you know, my my big my first big lesson <laughs> um we, you know, basically, I guess I came to the school and I talked about like how many, um, how many uh, my how many candy bars we sold. What my, you know, that we that my dad and you know helped me sell. Right. And 
and one of the kids, I guess, sold he he sold a couple extra ones to beat me. So I lost like by one candy bar or something. Oh my god! You know what I'm saying? So I, so I was really pissed off, man, because I didn't get that trip to Disneyland. <laughs> I didn't get that yeah. trip. I didn't get that trip to Disneyland, man. And I was—I mean, not Disneyland, but Disney World. And because uh, Disneyland is in in Los Angeles, right. but um, but Disney World. I was like, ah, man, I was really n- unhappy about it. But you know what? That's why this is my the first lesson is keep your mouth shut, stop running your mouth. Right. But the other lesson is you never really know. Like everything. First of all, everything happens for a reason. Right. So. Basically, even though I didn't win that trip to Disney World, what I did end up getting is second place prize, which was a bunch of prizes. Okay. And they give you sections in the pamphlet that you could choose from. Okay. Okay. And in that pamphlet, one of the things I chose was a turntable. Wow. That was one of the prizes. That was my very first turntable. No way. That's hilarious. So that's wow. why at the end of the day... It was meant to be that I didn't get the trip to Disney World because that turntable was one of the first turntables that I had, and that was the first turn one of the first turntables I had that, that I used to, to learn how to mix. Wow, DJ, that's amazing. So that's what I'm saying. Like, you know, even when you think you lose, you you actually may be winning. Absolutely, that's an incredible example of that too. So, so what was your concept of DJing at that at that age and at that in the in that year, you know, because um, hip hop itself still exists in a very uh, it's very very new the art form of it and it's not like this is probably even if you move to New York in '88 you know there's this is before even the invention of, of MTV and music videos and stuff like that so it's really more of a it's more of an analog. Re- vinyl record and cassette is really how you absorb music, right? So, what is that for you yeah. at that time? I mean, as you talking about at that time, man, this is way before '88. You know, what right. I'm saying like we we're going back to like you know like re- beginning of the '80s, you know right? What I'm right, saying? right. So, um, so you know, one thing I did, and I I don't do it as much as I used to now because radio is not the same as what it used to be. Um, but back in those days, what I used to do was always record radio shows right. and mix mix shows, you know. So I had my cassette tapes, and I would record, you know, all the mix shows and the in the DJ shows on radio. Do you remember the, any of those from the DC area? Like what? Who those shows I were? I didn't know about. I mean, or I'm, 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 I don't I mean DC. I'm I sorry, yeah, Baltimore. Yeah, it's yeah. a big dis- difference. Difference yes. between Baltimore. Well, I especially, apologize, especially back then, like very stark difference between Baltimore For sure. and DC. Yeah, my bad. And I'm there's wrong. no disrespect to DC. I love DC too, but it was you know there was a rivalry in a sense as well, you know. But we're very different different places. Um, DC, especially at that time, was really strong with the Go Go, and their scene was really really popping with 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 Go Go stuff. But Go Go um, didn't even really permeate into Baltimore. Much at all, right? Mm, a little bit, not not the way that it was a stronghold in DC. I mean, certain groups, Trouble Funk, you know, um, Rare Essence, you know, like a couple of the groups will definitely yeah. spilled over because some of the rhythms is just undeniable. It's funky, man. Right? You know what I'm saying? And that's like some of that stuff was sampled in early hip hop stuff. Oh, for sure. You know, you you listen to some of them early LL Cool J beats, you're hearing some some Trouble Funk. Drums and shit, yeah, it's you know, true. sampled into that. You know what I'm saying? So, um, so yeah, I, I think that. Um, so, really, going back to like I said, early early '80s. I mean, you're just hearing like a lot of the mix shows were on AM radio. They weren't even mm. on FM radio. You know, so I was listening to shows on AM radio where you can hear all this, you know, stuff that you wasn't hearing on right. FM radio and even though the signal might, you know, the recording and the signal might not be as as clear as the FM signal. Yeah, but, definitely. But AM signal reaches further away. Like the the signal is stronger. You can actually you can 
catch um, stuff from a much further distance. You right, know right. what I'm saying? And um, so, yeah, I was just, you know, recording stuff. And, and then we would travel. My family would travel, you know, like we, we'd come up to, you know, you know, Philly or or Jersey or New York. Or, yeah, you were saying earlier or, you have you had relatives or, in New York yeah, back then or, too. Right? Or wherever we go, like I would record stuff and I'd exchange tapes with with my cousins and right. you know, and friends and stuff that I met. Like we we were like fiending for music. So right. so any kind of music we can get you know, it was like, I was, I was always excited, you know, I always wanted to record the local radio shows, the mix shows with, in the different cities that I went to. So, yeah, because yeah. they're all different. I mean, they all represent a very yeah. different, yeah, demographic. Mm-hmm. Some, if there's regional, local stuff too, I mean, especially then. Um, yeah, that's dope, man. That's cool. There was a point in time when my aunt left New York and she started living in, in Philly. And, um, you know, so we would be in Philly. I spent a lot of time in Philly too, you know, growing up and um so we would come see her and um and I would record radio and stuff when I was there, you know, it's mm. like you know, I was I was getting music from different places. So it was like just over the years. So I think that in my earliest sense of hearing stuff, I listened to like some of the, you know, DJs in Baltimore who were who were doing stuff and then, you know, as I was growing up, you started hearing about, you know, it's you know, you would hear stuff and I would I would hear like um, music um, all of all around the city, you know, because people are blasting music in their cars, right. and you know, my grandmother, um, my grandfather on my mom's side, they, you know, they they were living in the projects back then. So I spent a lot of time at my grand grandparents' house in the project in Lafayette Courts, you know, um, over on Fayette Street. So I would be over there a lot you know that's when my mom grew up and and her brothers and and my 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 mom's sister my aunt and you know they all grew up over there so mm. so and my dad had in that one time was working down the street from there too he's from the east side too but he lived in a different area so both know. families both from baltimore yeah all right mm. so yeah so basically um so, you know, living there, especially when you're in a project, man, you hear music all the time, people blasting music, you know, because we were in the low rises, but across from us is the high rises, right. you know what I'm saying? So the high rises are there, and if you see, if you ever watch The Wire, it was a point you can watch when they start to, you know, blow, the, like, destroy all the towers and stuff right. like that, and, you know, like, yeah, those things don't don't exist anymore, so they, 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 um destroyed a lot of the, the, the towers and stuff that used to exist but um but you know but I you know grew up we would be over there 4th of July what it'd just be like fireworks and bombs right. and you know shootings and you know <laughs> whatever it was crazy you know right. but um but it always music was a part of the environment everywhere so from inside the house to outside the house you know we always always heard music so music has always had a you know it's it was like a backdrop to to right. experiences and memories in my life and 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 the people in my life is very deeply woven into you know um my experiences and and my greatest memories so well you i mean you had a group by high school i mean we even started by kind of going talking into that so what it, obviously at some point in time you get a second do you have a second turntable to create yeah, yeah, that yeah, group yeah, like yeah, yeah. Well, what's the format how, how did that even well, come the to the very beginning of it was um so i my first turntable was that turntable i got in that contest and just to make a record straight the following year we did the, we did the chocolate drive again and we won the first prize ah. no what? yeah and was it did you get to go to disney world no the second that year the prize was king's dominion so we went to King mm-hmm. Dominion. Nice. My brother was a baby at the time, so um, you just have one was, sibling, right? It's yeah, just you yeah, and your young, younger brother, brother, right? Yeah. So I mean, he wasn't like a baby baby, but he was young, you know, at the time. So um, um, so yeah. So basically, we went to King's Dominion. Oh yeah, maybe he was still a baby. I think he was a baby. If I, I'm thinking about photos of us out there, yeah, he was still a baby. So um, so yeah, we were in King's Dominion that following year. Um. 
But eventually, um, my brother had like a, I think like a Fisher Price turntable or uh-huh. something like that. And I think those are the first two turntables I put together. Um, you know, messing around Sorry. with with those, and um, and then eventually I had a I had a um, I had another turntable. Um, I tell you, I think it was called BSR. I can't remember. It was a black turntable, but it had the long spine in the, the center thing in the middle that stood up. Right. And um, I mean, it was no way I should have been cutting and scratch on, on that turntable, but but you know that's one of the turntables that really taught me how to like mix and blend without a pitch control. You know, what I'm and if it's those old style, even you know. They're obviously all belt drive turntables, and mm-hmm. you know where if you have to learn on that, you know uh, your your ability to finesse a, a, a record becomes so uh, precise because you're working on such a cumbersome piece of equipment. You know, it's not even really a piece of equipment; it's yeah, like a piece yeah. of shit. Honestly. But the thing is, I also I was I had like a Pioneer turntable from someone. Like I, basically, I had family members and neighbors and people who had discarded turntables that they didn't use or want anymore. And I basically would um, take their old broken turntable or I'll find shit left out in the street. I would take it and fix it and make it work. Yeah. You, you know, could, you could, you could tinker with it and fix I would, turntables. I would figure it out and right. make it work. You know what I'm saying? Like some of them just had, like you said, belt drives. Like there was some that, the belts were broken and not right. working anymore, so I had to like figure out like how to make new belts for it, and I would just take shit apart and just nice. like and try to make it work. And that was like the life. kind of classic way to learn about it too. Was actually literally taking taking something like a turntable apart, yeah. seeing what it's like on the inside. I remember that was even like a classic thing Dr. Dre would talk about in the early part of his career too. Was like yeah. taking apart turntables and like, mixers I still do that type of stuff I mean you know like if if people are familiar with my my history with the ASR 10 keyboard you know the right. Sonic ASR 10 um, so real quick a, for people that may not be familiar with what that is I mean obviously there's a lot of people that are but it's a, it's a piece of equipment yeah to, yeah in it's, the studio it's a is it's a keyboard but it's like a production uh, keyboard in a sense like you can actually do full production on it not just like playing like it really it's a sampler um, but it's a pr- production center in a sense where you can actually sample things into it you can or you can load sounds into it and you can sequence in it you know you can do a lot of things with the aerosol 10 you know um, so you know it's it I had mine since 1992 so and um and I've had several ones over the years, but I've been working with it since 1992. But the company eventually had went out of out of business. Um, so there's very few places that can fix them mm. when they go down. So basically, uh, a couple years ago, a few years ago, um, I had a major problem with with one of mine, and so I found this one guy who actually could fix it as a one guy who's really known who's well known for for servicing ASR 10s I think he's based in uh, San Jose California or something like that hmm. so I went to his website and I found him because I saw like message boards with people talking about this guy and you know getting you know you can take it to him to get it fixed or whatever but um the problem was that it was quite expensive you know you know like he his prices aren't that cheap um and um and i think and if he ever broke in part like you have to like you probably have to find a replacement part um right right and then he'll fix it but then you he he wants to hold on to the broken part ah. you know which i think he'll just go and you know repurpose, or repurpose it you know fix it and you know refurbish it and and resell it you know mm-hmm. reuse it you know so and i was you know at the time i was like i didn't really have a budget for all of that so i was like shit i'm just gonna i'm just gonna try to fix this myself i i don't know exactly what the problem was but i'm you know i'm intelligent enough to to know um basics about 
elect electronics and and how things work and you know so because I've been you know I've been I've I've had studios for you know for years right, I've right. built studios I've routed you know I'm doing all my routing I you know I, I've pretty much been my own engineer for many years um, in my own studio so um, so basically what I did was like I looked for the one thing I opened up the machine I looked into it and I was like all right I need to see what's the problem and I noticed that that one of the connections inside the machine had a, like a little burn mark at w on one of the prongs so I'm like it must be overheating somewhere right. there so I, I felt like it had burnt out the power supply so that's what I needed to fix and um so I had to look for a new power supply but that's not something you just find it's like you can't go just buy it so you have to like look on eBay or you know hope that someone puts one up right you know and that's what I did I just looked and looked and looked for months and months and months and eventually one popped up and it was in good condition I took a chance and bought it you know I'm like I don't know if it's gonna work but I'm gonna I'm gonna have to try so I bought it it got shipped to me I was hoping it would work so then I'm like now all right I need to take this thing apart and actually try to figure out how to fix this and you know but what I did was I I could not find any um, videos on YouTube with people um, actually servicing the ASR 10 but I did find a video of a guy who was actually extensively cleaning the ASR 10 okay so I mean this is like about like 11 videos or something you know this guy takes the whole thing apart and he's cleaning all the sections and taking out the boards and everything and you know big up to that dude you know, huh. for doing that because although that wasn't necessarily what I used his video for what it did help me is you know know the particular order to take certain parts out and you're taking out you know boards and and right. un unplugging you know cables and shit like you got to put it right back in the same way or you could fuck up the you know the machines so you got to pay very close attention when you're doing that type of stuff if you're not a, you know professional with it so right. um so yeah so basically you know I, I i took all the precautions i you know made sure i was grounded and you know, when i started going inside the machine and you know i i, I very extensively took did all the little things you know i'm a very detailed person anyway yes so, that i know so yeah and i and i did all of it i took it all apart and you know cleaned it a little bit too and then you know connected took the old power supply out put the new power supply in reconnected it put everything back in its proper place and stacked it all up closed the machine up and it worked Ah, nice. And I was like, you know, that's what you had to do. You just self service, you know, like a lot of these machines are like twenty, thirty years old, you know. So oh, it's yeah. like you gotta like you know, you gotta be able to like service them yourself if you if you still wanna use them. So right. um so yeah, that was the first time and then eventually I had another problem with it and and there was another issue that I figured out it wasn't the power supply this time. It was something else. And I figured out what it was, and I found that part as well. And it was actually more complicated than the first fix. Right, right. And um, and I had to got, buy some other special tools to get, because it was bolted in there a particular way. And, you know, so I, I, I did all of that, and I was able to do it again. But that shit dates back to my childhood. Right. Because that's what I was doing with these turntables. And that's what I did with drum machines or anything that was broken or people stopped using. Anything I can get my hands on, I would just take it, use it, and, and and try to make it work or figure it out. And, you know, and then if I can get it working, you know, put it to use. How did you figure out the to rec how to record your those first demos you guys did? Oh, for Born was, Busy. That was easy, man. I mean, you know, by that time, I mean, I'd already been DJing for years, you know. So, so you're yeah. DJing in Baltimore, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, is mean, it, I started, is it... started DJing when I was 11, so I was a kid. And, you know, so when you're DJing, you're learning how to, to, to spin and blend and, 
and all the different things I'm I'm learning. Um, eventually, you know, I I'm get I get good at it, you know. And then you start to want to do more creative things with it. So then, you know, back in the day, growing up, the pause button tape was a was a big thing. Absolutely. For us. So, you know, I started doing pause button tapes, but I was doing like real ill pause button tapes. I was like, mm. you know, like just ill blends, but stuff is happening, and I got really good. Like at my my finger and my timing was really good. You know, Dope. like being able to like, you know. The edits, because basically it's all editing. You know, it's not yeah. editing that you're doing, but you're doing it. This is no computer involved. This is just like you actually using the pause button on the tape and catching the right moment right. and stuff like that. I mean, to take it even further, I've also done edits where I was splicing tape too. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, but, that um, goes. Yeah, that's and, even the step before the and, pause tapes. Exist. And that's a whole nother side of it, but. But well, that's the, really how the earliest like disco edits and stuff that really existed oh, yeah. through splicing a tape too, like for sure, for sure. Um, so yeah, so when it came to the, you know, the pause button tape, I think I really that really was my um, training with my my timing and my ear to be able to catch things, you know, on the right. At the right moment, where it was so smooth, you wouldn't hear, you wouldn't hear the the edit. Right. It would just be sound natural, mm -hmm. you know. Yet it'd be like two or three things happening, you know, at the same time, and and then switches to some of the other things while other things are still maintaining, but new things are coming in. And I, like I I got really ill with it, you know. So I started doing these tapes. My cousin surprised me some years ago. He kept a lot of those tapes so. of mine. That um, that I did, you know, and um, I still actually owe him digital copies of that stuff. But because uh, he was like, why wow, you snagged them all up? He something? gave them to me. He said, I let you have these, but you just gotta give me a digital copy. Mm -hmm. But I still gotta give him the digital copy. But um, he always reminds me when I see him too. But <laughs> I mean, you know, I look at, it, I look back on it. I'm like, it's a little for me. It's funny, you know. It's also kind of um. It's, it's a certain amount of sentimental, I guess, when you think about that time. You Absolutely. Know? Yeah. Um, but at the same time, there's also a little embarrassing to listen to it too. You're like, oh man, what was I doing? You know. But like, in the moment, though, <laughs> when because I assume you were you were passing them around to your friends too, like you were sharing them a little bit, were you? Or uh, it was just for yourself a to a little bit, not so much. I mean, certain people, I was I was not like trying to like ah, everybody hear this, you know, right, like. Right. My people's yes, the closest people who I felt appreciated, they wanted copies of stuff. Sure. So I, you know, I, I'd give them a copy or whatever, you know. But um, my cousin, he was, you know, always like, he always appreciated my me DJing and. Well, family you know, is the best people to give it to because they're they're so non judgmental. If it's really some unconditional love, like. I would always, you know, you nah, know. No, 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 no. Because they'll nah, also keep it real nah, with you too man, and tell nah. you it sucks. Yeah, right? hell yeah, man. Especially back then, like family would tell you your shit is, your shit is whack. Your shit is whack. <laughs> like yo, that shit is corny, son. Get out of here. You know, like no, right. no. Nah, nah, they they would keep it one hundred with me. Like if my shit was whack, they would have said it's whack. You know, they wouldn't have been like, oh, it's just cool because it's my cousin or whatever. Nah, the motherfuckers would have would have went in on me. You huh. know what I'm saying? But because my shit was tight, you know, they was like, yo, you know, they was like, so I mean, it took me years. I mean, I got good before the world knew I was good. You know, even before my family knew I was good, like because I didn't just like it wasn't like a like overnight like I'm gonna of just not, start yeah. DJing and then I'm gonna. I was a fast learner, but. You know, I basically had to teach myself right. everything. I didn't have a, a mentor come in and sit me down and say, yo, this is how you have to do this and how you do that. Right. Like, the very beginning, like, especially with cutting and scratching, like, I fucked up a probably a, a, my f first one or two records, you know, if I figured out some things on my own. Sure. You know what I'm saying? But, um, but outside of that, like, basically, um, I taught myself and, and, and I got I got good at it, and you know I think the very first time I started, well publicly, 
in a group and a, and a bunch of people around was like family gathering. Right, sure. You know, so because you're, I mean, you you're know, not going to be in a club. I mean, you're still yeah. a young man, right? So what? Yeah, I'm. I'm not even a man yet. I'm still right. like a, you know, a, a kid, like in right. my early teens or something. Right. So you know, I'm. I was probably like, you know, like, um, you know, family family um, reunions and barbecues and stuff like that. Right. Like, I would DJ, but I would, you know, I'm DJing not just for, like, people my age, you know what I'm saying? But, like, you know, I have, like, older cousins and stuff, you know, yeah. like, who are doing more than I was doing at that time. You know what I'm saying? Right. So, I know these guys, if I was whack, they would have they been like, yo, man, cut that shit off. You know right. what I'm saying? They would have tried to sun me, but, but because it, it was, you know, I was good, they, they was... They was into what I was doing, you know what I'm saying, and um, so I feel like um, you know, a lot of that that time period, like I waited till I was good enough to to go out there and and be public with it. Where I feel like the difference is now is that a lot of people with the technology, they they start to fool themselves and think that that okay, oh, I want to I want to DJ or I want to do this, I want to do that, and they get some little technology and they. Learn a couple of things real quick, and that's the next week they want to be like in the club, right. or in the bar, or you know, putting it out there or putting the record out or some shit. When you know, when they haven't learned shit about music or haven't learned shit about you know that that craft, they haven't even gotten to really understand their craft yet. Right. Yet they want to be out there as a star. Like everybody wants the shit to be overnight, and that's not really how this shit works. Like you gotta like really take time. In lots of details and, and learn, like learn, like make a lot of mistakes before you get out there. Right. You know, because the mistakes is really, that is your opportunity to grow. You know, oh, so all the mistakes I made taught me a lot, taught me a lot and taught me how to, you know, to, to get really tight with my shit. You know, so, so basically, you know, I waited years before I got out in the public and started doing the stuff. I think privately, I I used to do um, mixes over the phone, like back what in do the you day. Mean? So yeah, so basically back in the day, you know, we didn't have call waiting. Call waiting is like when one person calls on one line and you can click over to the other line. And <laughs> yeah, enter yeah. It. We, this is pre that. This is the time when if someone's on the phone, it's just busy. Yeah, it, busy you, signal. It's a busy signal. You can't. They ain't no interrupting the line unless you call the operator right. and have them interrupt the line for you. You know right, what I'm saying? Right. But normally, it was just like, if you had to catch the, someone's phone line open, you know, if you want to reach them. So, I don't know. Maybe, you know, during that period of time, someone could have been trying to call my, my house, my parents' house or whatever, right. or whoever my friend was on the phone, they may be trying to call that house, but basically, I would. My friends from school, they you know they were into the music stuff too, and they they know that I was DJing, so they wanted to hear my spinning. Uh -huh. So the best way I could I could do it was like you know if they couldn't come over to the crib, they wanted me to mix on the phone. Right. So they would call me, and then, yo yo let me hear that mix. Let me you know whatever. So. I would do a little set, basically put the phone down by the speaker, right? And I do like a little set for like half an hour or forty minutes or whatever. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's so dope. And just mixing, and and actually, you know, which is really amazing when I think about it now, because everybody's attention span is like a nanosecond now. Like you couldn't even get someone to sit for five minutes at this point in time, right? You know what I'm saying? But at that time, like. My friends would stay on the phone for about 45 minutes listening to the whole mix. <laughs> you know what the saying? receiver up to their ear. Yeah, sure, right? you know what I'm saying? And then I'd get back on the phone with them. they yo, that's crazy. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And, you know, <laughs> so tough. I used to do... So that was my first audience was like my friends. You know, they're my first audience and my first critics. You know what I'm saying? Doing mixes over the phone. You right. know, that's with tight. Them. And, um... And then, well, that like, used to be the way that you would play people's songs too. Like later on down the line, where it'd be like, "Yeah, we record. I want, I want you to hear this new song I got here. You sit for five minutes and listen to this shit on the other line." And probably even how you and I originally, when we were working together on mm -hmm. when with Geology plays Geology, would be like, "Oh yeah," before you could even you know email a track or really mail someone 
something it would be like the most immediate way is be like yeah you sit and listen yeah uh, yeah but yeah so it's very funny man i think about like that that you know they would actually sit and listen to me mix for like 40 minutes man. <laughs> right. like you know almost an hour or whatever you know what i'm saying like that's crazy you know to think about right. it but um but yeah but that's how the culture was very like we were really into it like we were really into it and really excited about it and it was really honest you know right. it wasn't marketed it wasn't all over the place like like the people who was into it they were really into it yeah you know? did born busy ever do shows did you guys ever perform, even if it was like a talent show or for school? Or we battled people in the street all around nice. the city. Just... Yeah, I mean, we battled people around the city, and um, did you make a name for yourself as a group, like then locally? Um, was it about I think that? Anyone, or... anyone that battled us, <laughs> they uh-huh. they knew, you know. Um, right. Anyone that battled us found out, you know what I'm saying? Because. Um, it was really funny. I mean, I mean, that's it's like we, because we, we're talking so out of order with a lot of things. Um, we're kind of jumping over from this time period to that time period. But it's still that like before period. you even get to New York. I mean, we have there is it, a it a, is. a considerable amount of ground to cover. We could just talk about the the whole thing here. It could just be talking about your life in Baltimore before yeah. before pre nineteen eighty eight. But yeah. I do want to. There are a few other things I want to cover too. So I want to and and you know hit a couple yeah. targets along the way too. So. Yeah. I've always been intrigued because I remember back in the day, even here in this apartment long ago, you did play play me a couple of those demos that you guys had made. Um, so I was just curious if it was a thing where you actually had actualized songs that you would, or a routine rather, or, or the same rhyme that would be said uh, in different places, whether I mean, it be in a battle or not. We know? were trying to, we, you know, we were really focused and we really were like, moving toward the direction of trying to like get like a record deal is what we were trying to do um but there was a lot of different things that happened along the way and um so you know there's a lot of different stories um in different parts of this because well, what's your perspective because on basically it? when it comes down to um so like I told you, it's four of us in the group. You know, myself, who was known as DJ Plain Terror. Tupac was known as MC New York. Um, my friend Darren was known as Ace Rocker. And our friend Dana was also known as Slick D. So, um, Dana and Slick D was known, well, he was our beatbox. Okay. But he also rhymed too. Darren was, a, was the rapper. And Tupac was a rapper. They both were the, the MCs, and I was the DJ. Right. Um, and I also the beat maker. You know. Right. So, um, so you know, like we, by the time we formulated this group, you know, we had a lot of ideas, a lot of things we wanted to do. Um, but these guys were like writing rhymes a lot, like even even without beats. So it was really d- a different process of of working like the way that I learned in initially like later on started how it would be like basically I would make beats and MCs would write rhymes to my beats right back in those days it was quite the opposite like like Pac or or, or Darren or whatever these guys were just writing rhymes just to write rhymes yeah, filling you know, notebooks up with rhymes. They just be writing rhymes with no beats, no nothing, just writing rhymes, you know, and come up with songs and shit without music. And I would have to create music for the rhymes. Ah. So that's why initially I had these guys, when they would come to my house, we'd be up in my bedroom where I had my like little turntables and everything at and beat my drum machines and shit, keyboard. And I would record them on mic, not as like anything that was really meant to be heard for the outside world. Oh, sure. It was meant to be only for myself. I would record them, you know, so what would happen is I record them so I could learn the rhymes that they wrote. That way I can actually formulate the, the track, the music to it. You know, I would make a beat 
for for the for so we can make a song. You know, basically we wanted to record a song. So, you know, I would record their lyrics and I learn it and I'd make the beat and formulate it to the lyrics. Right. So and, the reference um, point. Yeah. So that was really what all those recordings were. But the very first recording that Pac and I did, um, that recording is ghost. I don't know where that is in the world. Right. You know, there was three copies out there that existed. It was one that Pac owned, it was one that I owned, and it was one that Darren owned. Outside of us three, there should be nobody else that had that. My copy, I know my copy is gone forever. Um, I don't know where do you know that? Because I fucked it up. You oh, know okay. what I'm saying? I, because basically at that time, I was like, um, I, I was dating this girl, the girl that I liked. And um, and I think I thought I had it backed up on another tape. I got and you. I, I know where this is yeah, going. Yes, so I made I made her a tape. Made and, a little love tape. Yeah, mixed I made, tape. I made a little <laughs> little love mixtape, and and on tape over, taped over the shit. You know what oh, I'm saying? Man. So I was like, fuck, like, you yeah. know. But um, cause Darren sh- should have still had his, but he doesn't know where his is, and nobody knows where Pox is. So. Right. You know, it maybe. But you have the memory maybe, of maybe of it they're sitting there. around somewhere. You know, you never know. know. You never you know. know. Exactly. It could be. It, you know, it obviously existed as a physical form at some point in time in in history. Was yeah. it? You know, it could be sitting in the fucking box somewhere. <laughs> you never know. You never know. But but um, but that very and that very first time was really spontaneous. We wasn't really really planning. To do anything like sure, it was the first time I did pot came to the crib, it was me, him, and Darren. Dana wasn't there that time, and um, and I just was playing them some beats that I made. And was it that they had heard, like, oh, yeah, Gerard's got beats, like, he's uh, he's the guy that has been messing with some beats, well, he's the guy with the turntable. They, we, yeah, by that time, that was already known, right? You know what I'm saying, and um, so. Yeah, so basically he came over the crib and he heard the beat and he liked the beat and he said, "Yo, let's record, let's record." So we started recording and he and he did this rhyme and it was dope and it was about this girl that he was dating at the school um, that we all were friends with too and um, and it was dope like he really sounded good on this beat like I was like, "Oh shit!" Like it was dope. So we recorded it and it was like we were all like bugging out because Pop went on like he just was. Going freestyling, but going dope. on and on and on, and it was dope. And it was like, yo, that was like crazy, you know what I'm saying? So we was excited, and then Pop, you know, he was excited too because he kept hearing it and playing it. And like, even for days after that, I mean, Darren was like telling me, he was like, yo, Pop would be like, yo, that's like, that's me. Like, he was like, because you know, even though he had been rhyming already, you know, before we even knew him. Um, and we were doing hip hop shit before he knew us. You know what I'm saying? Um, he, he, that was the first time he, he ever was recorded on top of a track. So it kind of blew so, his mind to hear his own voice yeah. like that. And, it, and, and it's interesting because, like, I'm the first person he's actually recorded with. Right, that's you amazing. You know what I'm saying? Which is really bugged out. But um, it's just a price, such a priceless thing to have. You know, it's just such a human thing. You know. Mm-hmm. And he was like, it's so funny because it sounds like his response to his own music is like the same as everyone else in the world where they're like, this dude, uh, this is the shit. Like, Yo, you know, it was, I love it, this. Shit. It was so spontaneous. It was like, right. you know, like we freestyle. I mean, I was rhyming it back then too. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like, we were having freestyle. We had battles at school, battling each other and shit like that. And, you know, just, it was fun. Like, we did it for fun, you know, whatever. But, um, but, like, that situation when we recorded that and I'm sure it wasn't recorded well like you know I didn't really know proper recording techniques and sure. shit at that time so a lot of that shit was recorded really horribly you know what I'm saying like it's like it's nothing that you can use in any any way you know to well that's what makes it know. kind of special too you know yeah. it's not yeah and it wasn't meant for that for me like anyway like right. even the recordings with the stuff that I told you, the stuff that I would have them like basically reference their songs, so I can actually formulate, you know, beats to the to the music. Um, like 
that stuff was never meant to be wasn't supposed to leave my possession. Right. You know, there's some things that happen and I think I had spoke about this um you know on on the time I did that show with with Dame Funk. Yeah, so yeah, know. yeah, earlier in the year or this past summer, yeah, you were on Dame Funk's uh Red Bull Radio show which was a monthly uh uh Glide Zone, Glide Zone on Red Bull our BMA uh, radio dot yeah. com, but there, yeah, you did. You revealed some of that stuff in that great, which was a great interview. Had a great mix that you did. You and Dame have a great chemistry together as well. Um, in particular, on that show was really great. So yeah, yeah. So you know, I had kind of reference to like how that eventually got out against my will, against what I wanted to happen because it was very personal for me, and I'm very protective of that stuff because you know the way. The way that people see Tupac is very different from the way I see Tupac. Tupac is like that's that was that's friend, that's that's family. That's like that's very personal for me. You know what I'm saying? So like when I think about Pac, like you know, that's that's some real that's some real shit in my life. That I don't look at Pac the way people look at him from a fan perspective or or, or they idolize him from a god, you know. Uh, sure, of course. You know that type of perspective that people kind of take it to when people pass on um, that they didn't, they didn't really know him, but you know, but you know, but I get it. I understand the impact that he made, and um, and I think that that is beautiful, you know. But at the same time, it's very personal for me. So I'm very private and I'm very protective of my personal and the things that people I love and the things that's very private for me and personal for me, things that I really value. Absolutely. As you should. Yeah, it's personal. Absolutely. So I don't, right. I don't throw that shit out there in the world like that loosely, you know, like a lot of other people do. And I don't try to make, you know, I didn't try to make a name off of anything that involved Tupac. You know, even some of those things are may involve me, but I don't make a, I don't, I don't go after that. That's not. Right. I have my own identity, and I've always had my own identity, and um, you know, I do so many things. That's why you, you know, you talk about how I'm connected on all these different spheres, and you know, and different circles of people over time, and, you know. But it's just like. My life, man, I, like I'm connected to a lot of different things. There's a lot of things that people don't know that I'm involved in, that I'm even behind, right. that people may never know, you know? Reason why certain people even connect it with other people, you know what I'm saying? Like, right. people, well-known, famous people that people may look up to, and some collaborations that came out of that, some of those things happened because geology connected this person A to this person B, and they worked together and they, you know, made history and whatever. And and that's, you know, that's, but that's the that's the way I look at it. I try to, like, build. I like to build with people. I like to no see. No question. I like to see, like, I understand there's a lineage here that we're all part of. And, yep. um, and there's a certain amount of um, responsibility it takes to, to uphold. Like, when you're in a position to have talent and abilities, and also have um, knowledge of self and and knowledge of what's happening in the world and to other people and just see the bigger picture. You you know, there's a certain amount of responsibility that comes with that, I feel. And um, I don't want to just... I'm not trying to be one of those people that just take it for granted right. and just, like, be selfish with it. Like, let me just milk it for what I can milk it for. Like, that's not that's not my personality. That's not who I am because there's a limited time that all of us have on this planet. Very true. You know? So, you know, everything that we do, it has to be well thought about, you know, well thought out because, you know, especially when you're leaving something behind that's going to outlive you. So you, any creative output that you leave in this world, that's, going to tell your story long after you can tell your own story, you know? Right. So right. I think that ultimately I want to be able to have as much control because I'm a control freak. You know, I am a Capricorn. True. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm a true fucking Capricorn. And um, so 
you know, I definitely need to, um, you know, do my best to like whatever I do, you know, I, I want to put out what, what I only believe in, you know, I'm not going to put out some shit out there that I don't believe in. I don't want to use my energy in that way. I don't want to use my blessings in that way. Right. I want to be able to only do what I can sleep well at night on. You know right. what I'm saying? So that's why I don't... I could be a big, a much bigger name right now in the world than I am. You know? But I chose that route. I chose not to. Not right. because I didn't, I didn't have opportunities to. I've had plenty of opportunities. I could have gone a lot of directions. But I turned those things down. I didn't choose to go those routes because that's not what I want. That's not why I'm in this business. I hate this business, to be honest. I'm not even about, like, I have I have no love for the music industry. I don't love... Yeah, I feel you. I don't love the music industry. I love music. I love creativity. I love art. I love, you know, people. I love, like, life. I love, like this blessing that we all have to exist in this miraculous way that we can exist. And, you know, and the, unfortunately too many people really just throw the shit and, and, and fuck it up. But, you know, but there's like a lot of, um, there's a lot of responsibility because there's a lot of suffering out here and you cannot close your eyes to it. Like, and I know a lot of people, it's easy for them to close their eyes to it because they don't want to face the reality of the difficulties of the world and and what's happening. But I can't close my eyes to that shit, you know, because you know it's it's part of the the struggle. I would not be here today had it not been for people who struggled before me, who were able to f- fight through the most impossible odds, you know, to to basically create what they created and to, you know, to elevate themselves, you know, out of situations that we can't even imagine. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, so I feel like, you know, like I have a responsibility to give back. Right. And because, you know, I think that is my rent to pay on this earth, you know what I'm saying? It's like, I've been given these abilities, I have to give back, you right, know? Right. And that giving back is not just giving back to those before me, but it's also giving back because that helps those after me. Absolutely, yeah. So. I, and I, yeah, I think that what you've already uh, put into the world, both uh, musically and visually, has absolutely, you know, inspired other people, which I w- I'd like to get to this thing right now. If I can, I brought an, an old newsprint okay. magazine i already know what that is <laughs> yeah. um well yeah this is a this is an old new york based print uh hip-hop magazine it's like a hip-hop um yeah. short-lived independent hip-hop mm-hmm. zine yeah. newsprint um called beatdown yeah do you remember this of course of course so you're Haji and sasa jenkins right which is part of uh kind of a great lineage of um, hip-hop journalism uh, New York City at, at a certain period of time when there was there was uh, an influx of artistic magazines a lot of artistic people collaborating together was kind of the the industry too like what we were just talking about mm-hmm. was still in a very different place it was a little sure it was still had a lot of um, devious uh, uh, people involved but um, it also, had uh, some pretty amazing stuff. I'm just trying to flip this over because I want to get to this thing because you're actually in the masthead of this too. But um, so for folks that may not be familiar with Beatdown, I wanted to give them a little preface this a little bit. Um, but this was one thing I wanted to show. I don't know if you remember this oh, particular yeah. thing. I, I do remember. That's funny. So, so obviously this is an audio only conversation. So if you could even just describe what, what this, this well, particular first of all, thing before is. Before we go here, Right. Can I just go through the magazine real quick? Cause I, sure. Because you know, we I have several, I have several copies of of, of Beat Down, um, and you know, to be interesting, yeah, look at that right there, Haji. Um, but um, but yeah, so um, basically, 
Um, this uh, earlier version of of this, before we had ads in it and before all of that, um, do you have the version of this that had the Cypress Hill illustration that Matt Dew did? That I don't I don't think so. This is what, of the same of the same issue. No, or, not this issue. No, I have a it's few a, other issues of beat down, but it's I, an earlier issue. So the early issue of beat beat down. There's one that has uh, Matt Du, um, you know, it was like my my former partner with Doable Arts, and my you know it was like my brother really, you know, it was like one of my closest friends. Uh, rest in peace. Um, he had basically um, did an illustration for this magazine before I was in this magazine right. because him and Haji were friends. And that's, he introduced me to Haji back before he even had an intro, even before he, before he even had artwork in this, in this, this newspaper. But, um, but anyway, in the early days, um, if you remember the first attack on the World Trade Center? Of course, yeah, where they drove was, under, under, underneath. underneath. So that day, I was in Elmont, Long Island, and I went out to see stay with Matt Matt Dew at his family's crib, where he was living at at the time. And um, it was on that very day that the attack happened, and um, at the world, the first World Trade Center right. before nine eleven. This is like years prior. This is like in in years, the mid nineties, yeah, early nineties. Yeah, years prior to that. So, um, so. I was at his crib, and he was actually still working on and painting the Cypress Hill piece, um, which was eventually was which was for the beatdown. So that was like I think that was the intro to us as Doable Arts being in in beatdown. But the thing it? was um, before that. So this gives you some breakdown on Doable Arts. Um, so as as we discussed earlier, you know, like I was in an art high school um, in Baltimore for four years. Baltimore right. School for the Arts. That's where I went to school with Tupac Shakur and Jada Jada Jink- and Jada Pinkett. Um, and um, so um, that's where I went to high school with Tupac Shakur and Jada Pinkett. Um, but anyway, um, so. Later, when I moved to New York, you know, um, interesting enough, um, wasn't the first year I was at School of Visual Arts, SVA, I didn't know Matt, because Matt wasn't, he's much younger than me, so he wasn't there yet. Um, so you're just kind of on your own in the school, kind of yeah, getting, getting, was- getting situated or what? Yeah, I was a little bit frustrated the first year of, of, of SVA because, um, to be honest, because I came from um, a, a performing arts high school. I had already had four years of training. Like, like art for me, like, I've been doing it since I was born. Like, basically, like, since since I was, I can't even remember. Like, like it's like breathing for me. Like, literally, like, I was doing it before I was conscious of what I was doing. Like, I... There are stories of me, like, and I saw these drawings in my, my grandmother's old house where I drew on the wall and stuff like that, mm. and books and stuff, as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a toddler, you know what I'm saying? Like, really young. And um, so I, I showed that talent from really, really, really young, you know? And, um, and it was detailed, like, and that was the thing that they noticed about it was, like, I, I, had, I always added details you know and that's what they were like wow like his his eye for detail is like crazy you know so um, well i mean that carries on with your later work it's extremely detailed it's, and i think it just carries on my personality period because i think just for everything i'm very detailed you know <laughs> right what I'm saying? so that's why I, th- I, I get frustrated with people quite often who are not detailed mm. and, and do careless bullshit because i get pissed because you know i think Details are details are important, you know. Um, so anyway, um, so yeah, so interesting enough, like um, 
when I moved to New York, um, my after going through that first year, I was a little bit frustrated um, because they made me basically go. I felt like I was going backwards. Like I mm. wanted to go directly into my major at school, but they did not allow me to do that. Like right. basically, they were like, "You have to go through a foundation year." But I'm like, "Oh, so you're... redoing the fundamentals of art or something?" Yeah, because like right. a lot of students aren't coming in with the kind of background that I have. Hmm. So, so basically, I had to like sit through going back to stuff I did four years earlier. Wow. You know, so I was a little frustrated about it. And um, and the very first day, you know, you're in college, you got to choose your courses. You got to make sure you can get in and register for those classes and stuff like that because, you know, each class is small and, you know, you may not be able to get in certain things that get closed really quickly. Um, so I was able to finally, um, you know, register for all my classes. The first day I go to one of my painting classes and instructor I had there was um I mean I didn't say he's whack but but I felt like he I could tell what he was about already from his first the first his first day of teaching I could tell what type of semester we would have with him wow. and I knew that I I couldn't sit in his class I couldn't be a part of his class anymore so I dropped his class after that first day because I was like, nah. I think I dropped it before the class was over. I think I was like, I'm done with this. I'm going to break right. out. And I went back to the registrar's office. And I talked to them about like switching to another painting course. Because I had to take a painting course. They forced me to do it. Um, a foundation painting course. But I was like, you know, I've already been doing this shit. Like, I'm more advanced than this, you know. But most of these students are not coming in there with that. So... Um, so I found another instructor. Only one instructor was like maybe like two or three options left, but the one seemed the more like something I could adjust to and work with. So I chose this guy's class, and I basically had to go into his class at the end of that first day. Like it was my first day, and I go to his class, and I'm like, is the place class is already over, almost, and I'm going in there because she's like, well. He may be full, but you have to go and ask him if you if he could let you in. So I'm run, you know. So I run to his class, find his class, and I, you know, I asked him if if he could let me in the class. He was like, no, no, I'm I'm full. I'm like, I told him I I had I had to drop my other class because I dropped the other class because the guy, the painter in the first class, he was a big fan of. Um, he was like a Monet fan. Right. So basically, his painting style was very just derivative of Monet's style. Right. And that's all he really wanted to teach us to do is paint in that style. And I'm like, oh, fuck that shit. Nah, man. I'm like, uh, all props do the Monet, but that's not what the fuck I want to do. You know what I'm saying? Like, and especially coming from where I just came from, I'm like, nah, like. Uh uh-uh, uh, that's a waste of my time. I'm gonna hate this class, you know. So I was like, I'd rather go to somewhere else where I feel I need a challenge. I need to right. learn something new. So I went to this other guy, and this other guy was definitely more like problematic. He's not gonna let me in his class, you know. But I convinced him. Like I, I was like, Yo, man, come on, man. Like you know. So he said, All right. He said, I'll let you in, but I'm gonna let you right now. You're gonna have double the work. Because, you know, blah, 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 blah. And he's like, get, he made it really difficult for me at first. Mm. But I came in there, every assignment he came, I smashed it, smashed it. And so I came in, and the whole class was just like in awe. Every time I put my work up, everybody was like, because, you know, every class you got to do a, a critique. Right. I put my work up, and everyone would be like, oh, my God. Like, And they, the whole class was like, yo, this dude, like... You know, and he hated it. He get mm-hmm. so he the teacher would be really upset because he he thought I was going to get an ego because the other students were sweating me, you know. But I was like, no, nah, I wasn't egotistical at all. I'm just like, this is just what I do. You know what right. I'm saying? Like, I just want my work to be dope. You know what I'm saying? And so he really made it really hard on me at first. Like every time, every week, I would come in and I would just come in with strong work, 
and the class was like, oh my God, like, you know, and, and he would just be like, mm. he always tried to like break it, like break me down. You right, know? right. But well, I was, that's so dope that you just keep having to I like. I kept elevating it. I kept right. elevating it. So, so, I came in, it. so I came in with like, so he had an assignment. Let's do a still life, all black and white. He didn't want to do any color at first. He's like, just do tonal shit. He wanted to do contrast. He wanted to really focus on contrast and texture. So all black and white type of painting stuff, acrylics. All right, cool. I do this shit. I, and the thing is, I would wait till like the last minute to do my paint. I do my shit like right the night before the class. Like I just paint some shit right. real quick. Classic. You just take it to class. Shit's still wet. You know, I'm holding it, walking to school in Manhattan, you know, holding the painting, you know, oh, far away from me because the shit is still wet. I'm like, just dry. Just, you know, just huh. want this shit to dry. Like finishing it right before the class. And, um, and the class is like bugging out about it. So anyway, he he was like, "Well, wow, okay." He said, "Well, anyway," he said, "Most people who who paint really well with tonally in black and white, they 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 can't do they can't do well in color anyway." You know, like he was just trying wow. to come at me like that. So the next assignment was a color assignment. So I did this piece that's like still a piece that I show to this very day. You know that piece I have the face. Mm-hmm. With yes. The, oh yes, I know, you know exactly. It's probably inside this this magazine. Yeah. Um, yeah. In, in the Under Pressure magazine that we had the interview with. Yo, that piece. I came in there. This piece. Beautiful. Yes. Was from that class. Wow, that's from from 80, back from 88, college. Eighty eight. Eighty eight. Nice. So, so that piece. I do this piece. It's beautiful close up women's profile in, in with green, red, black. Uh, it's, yeah, great texture. Just trying to describe it for right, the graphic. listeners. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, so basically, I did that piece, and I just shut him the fuck up. I shut him up, because he couldn't say shit after that. Like, it was just like, nice. you know, because, like, oh, what? You, oh, I can't do, you know, like, and the thing is, so the funny thing is, like, these colors and this color scheme, like, if you look at this painting, and this is pre-doable arts, like, this kind of color scheme, these kind of colors, the bright colors that we got known for, I've been doing that shit since high school, man. Right. So the reason why I, I want to point that out is because, you know, many years I I I didn't go back to visit the Baltimore School for the Arts, um, because you know I was in New York. I didn't I didn't really have I didn't really have that much time to go to Baltimore. Sure, I get it. You know, only would kind of go during the holidays or whatever, and that was when school would be out. But one time I made it back while school was still in session, and it was one of the first times I went back since being in, and this is after I graduated college, you know, this is like, I already went through four years of college and graduated. I started doable arts with Matt. Um, and, um, so, you know, I was showing him the stuff that we were doing and showing him Matt's work and showing him my work and showing him the work that we did together. And, um, when I went to the, back to my school, cause I showed my, my, um, one of my sculpture teachers and he was really, Mr. His name was Mr. Carroll. Mr. Carroll was like, in the time that when I was in high school, he was one of those teachers that people were afraid of. They was like, oh, Mr. Carroll, because he was so like, he's like real alpha male, kind of like just hardcore. Right. I love, I love, I love, I love that. Cause like, you know, it's like, I, I that shit didn't, didn't scare me. You right. know what I'm saying? So I was never afraid of Mr. Carroll. Like, Actually, he's one of my very favorite teachers I ever had at the school. Well, those types you will know? push you, too. Yeah, and I also pushed him, you know what I'm saying? Nice. Because it's like, um, you know, he wasn't used to people challenging him. And, and I would be one of those people that would challenge him. I always challenge my instructors because they challenge me, but I also challenge them as well, you know? I think we all can learn from each other. You know, just like nowadays, I can still learn from younger cats. You oh, know? No question. But I can also teach younger cats, too. You know what I'm saying? But um, I think there's, I think you, we never stop learning, you know? And I think that's the beauty of it all. It's like to never stop learning. Right. But, um, but anyway, when I showed him my portfolio, I didn't even think about it. You know, I just showed him my, he was like, yo, you have some artwork with you? Got anything I can see? Because he had his class going on at the time. And um, so I'm like, okay, sure. I didn't want to show him, you know? But he's like, yeah, I want you to show the class, but let me look at it first. So he opens it up and he, t- and he tells the class, come, come around, come around, everybody come around. And he starts going through my portfolio, and he came to this piece right here with the face that we just talked about. 
that I did for that 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 first year at SBA. Right. And um he was like, Oh, one second. And he goes into then he's my sculpture teacher. He goes into his shed. So he has a shed in the classroom where he keeps all the supplies and all the tools and stuff. He comes out with a physical mask that I did that he mm. kept. It's been like fucking four or five years, man. Like five years basically. Right. Five years since he's seen me. He pulls out a mask that I did. And he that he kept I mean that shit really touched my heart, That's man. Tough. And 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 he and he said he said, this piece right here, this painting, he said, you started doing this in my class. Because mm. I used to paint those masks, and it was just like that. And I'm like, I didn't, I didn't connect the dots. I didn't realize that, oh, shit. Yeah, I, re- I was doing that back then. I was. And really, it actually started before his class. It started with um, um, Louis um, Flores, with Mr. Flores' class, which was like um, a mixed media teacher that I had who's a, a Latino brother who grew up in Gowanus mm. but he was teaching in me in Baltimore you know Brooklyn cat you know um, dope I really, I really like Mr. Flores but um, so he really this kind of stuff I kind of started in Mr. Flores's class which takes me back to my uh, 11th grade year of high school Right. So really, me developing that color palette and that style and that texture goes back to me eleventh grade in high school. Well, a lot you know? of the 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 stuff that you would do, you know, after um, SVA when, when both for as a collaboration with Matt Dew and Doable Arts, but um, the you know the material, all the wealth of material you did on your own as well. Ha- is a lot of it is character based. It's a lot of faces. It's a lot of human bodies and stuff like that. I mean, you look at these um, record covers too. And not to really jump ahead, but I do want to like really. It's important to look at these and talk about these. I mean, in the you know one of your most iconic ones is this body rock uh, mm. record with Q Tip, Most Def, and Tash from the Alcoholics, which was from the 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 height of the Rockus Records era. Uh, 12 inches is a you know sean j period produced it um yeah and it's you know obviously right now we're just peeking at the this one from the magazine i mean your portfolio is underneath this too and uh um unfortunately we can't look at the original painting yeah um, so i sold it to my man lefto um in brussels well yeah. that's quite a score because it because yeah. it is a, it's a pretty <laughs> intriguing picture too because there's a lot going on um that you might not catch the immediate uh, eye. Yeah, but, but if you open up the portfolio, you yeah. see the actual. You can see a copy of the, of the piece of the painting. Oh, which right. Gives you a more detailed view without the the typeface going across the right. image, um, which we could definitely get into. I want to break some of that down. Yeah, I'd love to get in into a moment. it. Yeah. Before we go there. Though, yeah, no doubt. I want to kind of break down some things about me and Matt do. Well, yeah, so, I, yeah. And so, just to preface this really quickly, too, because there really is not a lot of information about about that. There's not a lot of uh, yeah. stuff. There's not a lot of stuff online. You know, there's yeah. not a lot, you know. That's of, a complicated situation right. because, you know, it's a lot of complicated things. When, well, you talk when, about whatever when, you feel yeah, like when, you want. Yeah, yeah, it's complicated when we kind of get into um, Matt and other parts of, of the story. But, but um, the artwork alone, but, though, um, is pretty but, amazing but to talk about. on the art about. side of it, um, you know, like, he came to SVA um, a year after me. Um, and um, so I met him in my second year of SVA. And, um, and we... Yeah, we just connected, man. We it was very it was such a natural connection, um, because you know we had a lot of the same interests. Like we had, you know, like hip hop, you know, right. and um, you know, and, and you know, painting and and you know, just a lot of similar interests. And you know, he was from Queens and. And I was from Baltimore, and he felt like that was some, some in his mind. He felt like that was some similarity, of because he felt like Queens was like city, but it's suburban city. You know what I'm saying? Right, right. 
and he felt like, you know, Baltimore, even though that that is city, but it's outside of New York, you know what I'm saying? So, right. you know, he, he felt like we just had like some, some type of connection, you know, which we did. We had a lot, a lot of different connections and, um, um, and Matt, you know, but I think where our differences draw from is that, um, Matt was really big into comic books, mm. which I totally get because you know comics is a big part of of kind of like the black community and our our hip hop history and our past. With it, it's like you know a lot of the DJ names and stuff are like almost superhero type names. Right. It's all about superheroes, you know. what I'm saying so. Um, I just wasn't a big comic book collector that's mm, not interesting yeah I, not, I never asked you that that's yeah. not what i collected you know i collected albums and records right. you know so a lot of my visual influence came from record covers and artists who painted on record covers and um whereas matt's influence came from comic book artists and artists who painted the covers of punk comic right. comic books you know what i'm saying so where we connected is kind of like the kind of futuristic fantasy um, illustrators. You know what I'm saying? Um, so, you know, you have like, um, you know, you have illustrators that actually kind of went to both worlds a little bit. You know, they may have done some stuff in a comic book land but also did some stuff on the on the album cover right. side, you know. And um, there's there's, a, there's one in particular, but his his name is escaping me at the moment. Right. Um, I know that for this magazine article I wrote, Frank you, Vizetta. Right. So Frank Vizetta is one of those guys where basically he was a very you know kind of like fantasy, futuristic, you know, painter illustrator. And um, so he did a lot of like you know, comic book covers and stuff like yeah, that, maybe right. and other stuff. But you know, some of his work ends up in record in the world too. You know what I'm saying? And music related stuff as well. And um, so I think and and then there was another Matt had another favorite, and I I totally at the moment can't think of the the guy's name, but he was a big influence on Matt's style, the way that Matt painted. He really um, was really influenced by this guy, and his name is escaping me at the moment. But I'll look; I can look it up and, and tell you. Yeah, for sure. Um, so that was one of his um, influences in in his style and developing his style of painting and his color palette and everything. Whereas for me, what influenced me in my style of, of painting and color palette and everything came from an album cover artist. Um, um, Abdul Mati Clarewine. So, he, he did those uh, Miles so he, Davis. He shows. did the Miles Davis Bitches Brew cover. He did the um, he he did the uh, Earth Wind and Fire Last Days and Time mm. cover. Um, he did a lot of amazing covers, and so like incredible so imagery. I, so the thing is, Matt would educate me on a lot of comic stuff that I didn't know about. You know, he would really school me on a lot of the comic stuff, and I would school him on the, on the album cover stuff that he didn't know about. Right. You know, and that was like a really nice thing because he learned things that he didn't know. I learned things I didn't know, and then we combined our our abilities together. So, you know, so like you know, Matt didn't do graphics. He wasn't good with graphic stuff. Like Matt knew that I could paint. And I could do all that stuff too, but I could do. But he could paint too, you know what I'm saying? Right. So, but he wasn't. He didn't feel comfortable with graphic stuff, you know, and doing logos or right. anything graphic because that wasn't really what he was trained in. And he was better at illustrating, you know, mm -hmm. and painting. Um, well, I mean, look at that organized so, infusion cover. I mean, it, it looks like an incredible amazing. comic. It looks like the most incredible comic book ever. You know, yeah. like and uh, a lot of it is influenced directly from comic book stuff. If right? You, there's actually well, I mean, the Incredible Hulk hands of Pharaoh Monch. There's you know. certain references from that that definitely, you know, goes definitely right. The, the Thor, the Hammer of Thor. But yeah. I mean, it's so. Yeah. 
But you can associate that with lyrics from Organized Confusion for sure. easily. For know. sure, exactly. You know what I'm saying? Like, Pharaoh, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's why that really connected, you know, so... And did they ask him, like, hey, man, would you be down to do this? Like, do you, just really quickly, do you know, like, the origin story of just how he was even asked? Or was it more well, like, yo, Matt I want to do... Queens, Pharaoh's from Queens. Um, I mean, it gets it gets even more complicated because... Um, I, so, basically, one of Matt's childhood friends, um, my, my homeboy as well, like my brother... Um, Neville Neville Cummins, um, aka Tez Moore, my man Tez. So Tez and Matt used to be kind of art partners at one time. Okay, you know, Tez is is he's kind of like the one of the the unseen members of Doable Arts. Mm. Like he's part of the crew, just like a Pony B Fly is also in a way part of Doable Arts family as well. You know what I'm saying? Who's a Pony's a dope. MC and yeah. you know and now she's doing like you know I guess she's doing like other stuff these days um, maybe hair makeup and stuff but um and was it but, like the anti pop guys too Beans and High Priest were associated to I don't want to get too tangential no but. They, they, they are they are people's they're friends of ours right but they not they're not like really doable arts gotcha they're people we met as being doable arts we met them right you know what I'm saying, and um, and that goes back to the time of the boom poetic. You know about the boom poetic? No, I don't know about that at okay, all. Okay, well, if you open up this portfolio and you looked at this, that's the boom poetic. So what's the so, story with that? The boom poetic. Do you know about Shaki? Shaki, I remember Shaki. Yeah, Shaki. She, she, so uh, Hanifa, she had an album. Hanifa, um, aka Shaki. Um, she. You know, dope, dope, lyrical, and um, basically, you know, her manager at the time, um, Walter Mead, who also mm. later be known as Walter Mudu, um, basically, he kind of was kind of like managing Shaki, and I think maybe Priest, and all these, all those, there was, we met all of them. Me and Matt just being because you know New York was like a mixture of, of, of like um, a melting pot of artists coming together in Big an time. underground scene. Big time. So, so me and Matt were the visual sides of that, but there would you know there was also you know the the spoken word artists who right. who were part of that. There were the MCs that was a part of that. Was the musicians that was a part of that, and you know the whole gamut. So basically the Boom Poetic had a lot of those people. So like, you know, we we met a lot of these kind of underground spoken word artists and, you know, so we got to meet, you know, Beans, High Priest, you know, eventually you you start to meet people like like Mums and, you know, just all these amazing artists, you know, um on the underground scene that we all just connected together, you know what I'm saying? And, um, and I mean, the, the, it's interesting how the field really expands out. Cause when you start to think about over time, you start like meeting a lot of different people from MCs to, um, singers, you know, right. some, uh, vocalists, you know, <clears throat> to, you know, to everything, you know, like it's all of the creative people. Yeah, New York we was all, a rent in a renaissance period at that time. Exactly. You know? So we all were connecting together. I mean, you know, to the point. I mean, you know, going into Bobito and you I know, because yeah, that's even the height and, of Stretch and Bobito. Now Bobito yeah. even existed in that world too, outside of the Stretch and Bob show too, and hosted a lot of hosted the, the yeah. open mic. And yeah, and with words. New Eureka Cafe. Right. Man, I used to be there. All the time. I mean, it's a lot. It's a lot of that. Like we were. What in, was Rocky's thing? You did the, the thing for Rocky's oh, thing yeah, too. What was that um, called? Uh, Rocky's thing. Uh, what was it called? It, it was. was um, it was before. Um, uh, oh, I'll tell you in a couple of minutes. Um, what was that Rocky's thing, man? Rocky was um, a uh, you know pivotal New York uh, promoter, but curator, but also like sort of a uh, the. 
pre-Lyricist Lounge. Uh, he was very influential. I love to talk to him too. On the, but as we flip through this giant, incredible portfolio, yeah, yeah all, all that. that. So yeah, yeah, Rocky was it was all that it was hip hop, poetry, and jazz. So um, yeah, that was all those like you know, like I said, it's a mixture right. of all these things that have a connection with each other. Um, which sometimes people like try to classify in these separate categories, but really right. it's all the same energy. You know, yeah, it absolutely. All, it'll all come together in these kind of like... Well, when you start um, to try to sell something, that's when it gets commodified and they throw genres and labels on it, you know, so... Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. So, but yeah. we're, just trying to, we're trying to get to this thing, too, just yeah. trying to... And just to give you a little background on Walter, too, Walter mm-hmm. Moodoo, um, like we had fell out of contact for a while because we hadn't talked to each other. Um, just, you know, just life. Everyone's moving in all the different, you know, ways. Everyone's busy and making moves and stuff. But we, we, we connected because we saw each other somewhere. And it was like, oh, let's be, you know, let's get back in touch or whatever. And at that time, Walter was, like, on the production side of working on the Death Poetry Jam with mm. Russell Simmons. So that's a very interesting story that will take you back, take us all back to... Um, that ultimately would take take the story back to Baltimore for me. Right. Take me back to Tupac stuff, which we can go into it now or we can go into it later. But that, like I'm saying, it's, this shit is like so, it's such a web. It's, it's it, such no, a web. No, I know. My life is such a web, man, because I'm connected to so many different things that Right. So I mean, we could go. Don't even know. Right. Man. And we obviously could talk for hours and hours too. Where you know, now we're at an hour and forty minutes, and have barely scratched the surface. You know, there's a lot of other stuff I'd love to talk about, and maybe down the line we can we can do a, a part two as well, um, which I would love to do. I would love to talk just if we can pick. I want to pick one thing just for a second, and just describe the process of 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 laying out and creating the cover of Body. Rock the twelve inch just for a moment, um, okay. since it is a pivotal thing and it's a, well, you know to a give beautiful you the painting. basis of the origin of where that all comes from. So when I was in high school, um, I had a you know I studied photography um, a little bit in high school and um, and um, and then I mean I. I I, I carried it over into actually into college too. So basically, I I studied like photography like five years, mm-hmm. basically, right. and it, which started in high school and then went into college. Um, so over that five year period, um, I learned a lot. You know, I learned about a lot of techniques. You know, like like this is real photography. It was like you know we like shooting. Or film, right? Um, you're in the dark you're room. In the dark room, you're mixing your own chemicals. You know, you, all all of that shit. It ain't, ain't, no, ain't nothing digital about it. This right. is pre-computer. This is like real photography. You know, so I learned a lot of techniques. I learned about you know setting the aperture in certain ways, and right. you know, and just you know the timing, and you know, I was experimenting. I was doing double, triple quadruple exposures and Dope. shit like yeah, I love that doing shit. interesting things with it with light and letting in just a little bit of light here and there and 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 being able to like really do some really creative different shit right. you know so I was really into photography I really loved it and um it's just that it was a very expensive field sure to, of course to be in and um so I didn't pursue... Well, know, record collecting is too, and, and being a producer yeah, and DJ. So exactly. You're picking the good ones. Then, I yeah. know. It was hard because, I mean, I, like I said, I told you from the beginning, I had interest in a lot of different things. So it doesn't just stop at music and and, and as, as far as production is concerned, right. or even as far as DJing is concerned, or even as visual art is concerned as far as painting or design or graphics. Or, right, 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 right. Yeah. Or... You know, animation or whatever. But know? but now the body rock though. Yeah. It looks so, it do, it looks like a photograph. Okay. A fish eye. So yeah. So the, that was the point. So let me go back to the story about the body rock first before yes. I, I go into the technique. We'll, yeah. We, I'm yeah. sorry. No, I gotta, no 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 no. Gotta be long winded with it, man, because there's just so many details. Let's break you, it down. Break it down. You gotta know. You gotta know. So anyway, let me first then go back to the 
the technical history of my photography again go back to high school so high school I had the photography class um, and I started learning all these techniques with photography which basically eventually we went from taking all our own photos to our instructor um, having us create collages mm. so High school was the first time I started doing collages with with my own photography. And then I started building pictures and building photos and images with that. A lot of that stuff is what I used to audition to get to SVA because mm. I had to audition to get to SVA as well. Okay. You know what I'm saying? All right. Okay, that makes so, sense. So basically, I had to use some of my photo stuff that I did in high school to, to help me get into the college, you know. Um, so... That is where some of the techniques that you see in the body rock started in high school. You know, also the color scheme. Color scheme goes back to Mr. Carroll's classes. You know, where I I did sculptures and I would I would build sculptures out of wood and mix me mix materials um, and hot glue gun shit together and and I, then I would paint them and I would paint them really bright oranges and blues and and you know and black contrast and you know I would do all this shit and actually I won awards from some of the sculptures I did at his Amazing. in his class. Um so I actually won partial scholarship from some of that stuff that helped me go to college. Cool. Help pay for school. So um so a lot of that shit originated back in Baltimore for me. Right. Um, it just so happened that I met Matt later on when we were in college, you know, my second year of college, that his color palette was a little similar to mine. You know, not necessarily the same, but similar in the sense that, you know, he had certain types of colors and 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 bold boldness that I grew up painting like that too. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. And the blues, oranges, and reds, the primary colors are like a really uh, they pop hard. Yeah, exactly. And then, you know, so like I said, it goes back to his references come from comic books and seeing those type of colors and and and, and getting that type of you know, that made an impression on him. Whereas me, like album covers I saw those same type of things too and that had made an impression on me and they were quite similar in certain ways but even though they're different completely different right. worlds um, so when it came to me doing the body rock so this is like this is post doable arts like now doable arts is not we're not a unit anymore you know you know me and Matt you know had a sort of a you know, not really in touch with each other the way that we once were. Like, we used to be always together all the time. Like, you, it was like freaking frack. You know what I'm saying? Like, you go out together, you hang out together. Always. People were always together. saw us together. Always. Like, we, because we, that's how we, 1993, man, that's when we first got our international recognition and even local recognition in New York City. Us together. You know, we were like the, we were, uh, you know, we were a force. You know what I'm saying? Working together. And um, and we got a lot of props. I'm you know, sure. I bet if you were in the we club, the two of you in the club, I bet people were, uh, you know. Always, man. Like, maybe a we, lot of love. We got a lot of love. We got a lot. I mean, that's how we were on the list for all the fucking parties, all the clubs, all the private parties, all the everything. You know, like, and we worked with all the record labels from Tommy Boy to Bad Boy. You know what I'm saying? Like, Well, there's we lots of ad campaigns. I mean, that's why the magazines really play a big, big role in it. Yep, magazines, all of it. We worked with all of those people. So, anyway, um... <laughs> So yeah, that has been part of our, our history, and we, you know, we we took that, even though it didn't last as long as it could have and should have, um, we did a lot of damage in a short amount of time. Absolutely, people knew who we were from that day forward. Um, so anyway, so now we we bring it up to speed with Rockets days. Matt had his own relationship with Rockets outside of mine, and I had my own 
you know, relationship with Rock is outside of his. And mm. me and Matt weren't really even in touch with each other at that time. Yeah, okay. You know, so, you know, so I didn't even really know what he was doing and he didn't really know what I was doing. We didn't see it until it came out, you know. Which is bad because you both have two of the most recognizable Rockus covers in their catalog, Body Rock, and he did sound, Fun, Fun Crusher sound Plus bombing. and Sound Bombing, right. Yeah. Mm. Um, so, um, so yeah. I mean, and then also, I mean, I, as as more to it, other stuff I did for Rockets too. Um, over the years, outside of the music, of course, I did music with them as well. But um, but on the art, we're just speaking on the art for now. Um, right. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. I didn't actually plan on doing this cover. Um, this was during a time period where, um. I was hanging with Sean J. Period. Of course, like that's like me, Sean J. Period, um, Most Def, you know, Yashin, Yashin Bay, and um, uh, was Kwali around too? Or yeah, yeah, Kwali was around, but he wasn't really over there with me and Sean J. So much. It was more me, Most, and Sean J. In '88. Wow. In the Keys. Right. Um. So. Um. I know that's a so, story in itself. Well, in in a sense, because basically, I lived up the street from. So interesting enough, at this time when this all was happening, I lived up the street from Sean J. And actually, this is the closest that me and Matt ever lived with each other. Matt was living up the street from me. Hmm. What neighborhood but are we talking about now? This is this is an. Um, I was on the borderline of Clinton Hill, Fort Greene. Because right. I was on I was on Gates. And Clinton Avenue, mm, right. right near the corner. Matt was living in the people used to call it the um what building they used to call it what did they used to call that building um they used to call that building the Melrose Building. It was a building on Gates Avenue that everybody in the music industry at one time was living in. Oh yeah, it was like a building like all the people from the music industry. He was living in this building when everybody started moving over to Brooklyn. Um, Matt happened to be living in that building at one time, close to me, but I never actually saw him. Um, I never actually went to his crib there because mm. it was a it was a period of time we weren't really communicating that much. Mm. But I would see his girlfriend at the time, Tracy. Gotcha. You know what I'm saying, and um. I would see Tracy more than I saw Matt, and I would see her. Cause every time I went to the subway to go to the city, I would see her on the subway about to go to the city. So, um, and that was, you know, um, and I didn't really know her that well. I knew of her, uh, but it, you know, that was like I said that that was a point in time when Matt had gone through a lot in his life, and a lot had changed in his life. Um, from back when we used to hang really tight. I mean, that is a lot. It's a very long and and extended story of of a, of things that happened um, over the time period um, prior to that period when Matt didn't um, and I didn't really speak as much. And sure. and that was hurtful to me because I really you know I love I loved them and. Um, and you know I didn't want it to be that way, but it, I wasn't the only one. Like um, there was other friends of mine, and, and also you know a female friend of ours that was really good friends with me and Matt, um, who also Matt wasn't speaking to her either. He was in a different space in his life, and you know it was, and I think it's his relationship, and, and a lot of things that contributed to that mm -hmm. but um but I think there were some things that happened prior to his relationship that actually changed him you know and um and then it was you know it was some some difficulties that you know that he was going through um which you know after you know someone for so long and you're so close to him for so long it's you know it's it's hurtful when you you know you want to be there for them but because there was times where I so there was a point in time where I left New York City and yeah, you moved to Atlanta? I moved to Atlanta in 96 for six months. Okay. And then I moved back to New York in 96. Same year. Left 
and came back. But I told everyone that's what I was going to do. All right. But that was basically after this kind of big situation that happened in Matt's life um, had went down. And um, so things were really different for him after that he went through the situation. And um, so basically, um, you know, but I had met. You know, a woman that you know, it's, it's my, she's my ex girlfriend now, but um, but at the time, you know, like we were just starting to date each other, and she was living in Atlanta, okay. And um, so you know, we started dating each other, and I moved out there, and for a couple of reasons to to I, I had a access to doing um, an art, an art gallery show in Atlanta at a, at a gallery called um, King King Plow, um. Which I tried to invite Matt to be a part of, but he, which was odd enough, he didn't want to do it, you know, which was, I didn't, you know, but like I said, that was a really, I, I, that was a really complicated situation that right. he went through that was very personal and, you know, I'm not going to get into, um, but, um, but I, it was a life changing thing for him and it was, a, which also was a relationship thing changing for him for us you know um because i think eventually from that point forward um you know he was never the same person and you know even though we did hang out and and um interact for a while after that um there was a certain point where we we didn't speak at all and it Mm. wasn't my choice it was he chose that route and um, his girlfriend chose that route Mm, and um so, um, so, you know, unfortunately, you know, they had a lot of misconceptions about a lot of things and, um, and, you know, and it wasn't, you know, what, it wasn't a good period, but, um, but eventually, you know, which was good is that, you know, cause he also got estranged from his family as well. Right. So it wasn't just me and it wasn't just my friend, uh, my homegirl that I was telling you that he was friends with. Uh, our friend Stephanie um, that was uh, there was other people and there was also his actual family certain parts of his family that he was kind of estranged and kind of moved away from and um, so I felt like that was a difficult time that he was going through but that was a time that he did the uh, company flow stuff and you know, oh gotcha like, so I wasn't there when he did that stuff yeah, so you know, so when he did the company flow stuff, I think also was around the time much a little little after that he did the tags of the times. Tags of the times, which were people may remember these were these great hip hop compilations of Mary Joy recordings, this Japanese, Japanese label. label. My yeah. man Hero was uh, the A and R of these, if I'm not mistaken. I remember him well. Uh, both really cool, but the yeah the artwork was way darker. It was much cryptic. Darker. Yeah, yeah, ta- especially Tags of Time and, too and, is and, really cryptic. And that's what I'm saying. The thing about it is, like this stuff was definitely a period where so the, so just to give people understanding, like Doable Arts was Matt Do and I together, right? You know, like basically the story behind Doable Arts is that um, while we were in school like Matt used to show me his artwork and I show him my artwork and stuff like that and, and sometimes he would ask me to help him with certain things little graphics here and there whatever but eventually he got to the point where he was like yo man um he was like I'd like to start a, a, a company with you you know and um you know are you down and and I was like oh hell yeah sure why not you know what I'm saying like you know, he wanted to do a, like a little art company. So he wanted, to, you know, he, his name is, you know, Matt's name is Matt Reed, you know, right. but they called him Matt Dude. That was kind of like, um, that was kind of like a childhood name that cause, cause kind of re- referencing Scooby-Doo. You gotcha. Know what I'm saying? Right. Um, so anyway, you know, so Matt, amazing, brilliant, like super brilliant artist, you know what I'm saying? Really dope and expressive and, technically just amazing you know out of this world um so it was like a perfect match like because we both were very detailed you know 
with with the way that we illustrate and um and, and always had con- concepts like con- conceptual shit was always really deep behind the stuff that we do yeah deep you know? conceptual art for sure yeah and um so the whole tagline for doable arts was like the mentally ill illustrated artwork right you know what i'm saying so basically which you know, I think for Matt was more personal because, you know, I think that he felt like in, you know, without divulging too much, like that was a it was a thin line between you know we 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 we, we kind of like discuss often the thin line between genius and mental illness, right? You know, and um. And it was very personal for him and stuff that happened in his family. So I think that was really something that, uh, a subject that he was really, um, it was very personal for him. You know, for me, it was personal for me too, but in a different way. You know, I understood it because I also have, you know, I also had family also that, that had mental illness too. Um, and I think that just in community in the world, you see mental illness in many forms that it's almost a, it, it gets kind of like, a, I don't know, it's like a stigmatism to it, you know, right. where it doesn't get addressed and it doesn't get um, sp- spoken on and in a lot Absolutely. of people, you know, it kind of gets pushed off to the side. Whereas I have an older cousin who I know that she had long had like her whole side of the family, which was on my dad's side of the family. That's one of his cousins. You know, she's much older than me, but she had mental illness and she was institutionalized for a long time. But, you know, but she had been married for many years and stuff like that. But her parents both like my, it's like my great aunt and my, and my great uncle, brilliant both of them super geniuses they're so smart really smart people you know what i'm saying and so she even though she had this mental illness she was really brilliant Mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying and um i think you can see that also when you when you look at stories about people with autism and stuff like that and just the abilities that people can have that seem superhuman in a certain way you know what i'm saying even though it's maybe in other aspects of their personality, they may struggle right. to fit in and to be normalized in the way sure. society is structured. But or often misunderstood. Misunderstood, yeah. exactly. But but they also can have these amazing abilities and in, in, in stuff like that. So um, so I feel like you know, with Matt having his own personal struggle with certain things and also things that are very directly connected into him. Um, family stuff. Um, I, you know, I think that was like a, a a really important theme for us to tackle. Right. You know, and we try to tackle it because we were trying to break down people's stereotypes about certain things because we understood we were thinkers. We, you know, we we're like really thinking about a lot of things and put a lot of we had a lot of conversations. We would conversa- have conversations about all types of stuff all the time. Really deep deep, 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 deep level conversations, mm. you know, so you know, like we're reading books, we're like, you know, we really intellectual type shit, you know that we're getting into but anyway, so by the time of, so you know, like as I said, doable arts was him and I together, but the by the time that doable arts was somewhat disbanding because I left New York to go to Atlanta for six months. I, I literally moved out of my apartment. Right. You know, to move to Atlanta. I moved all my shit to Atlanta for like six months. And then I moved all my shit back to New York for the second chapter of my New York life, which began in Brooklyn. Right. So that's when I... Because I lived in Manhattan right. for the very first eight years of my life. Right. You know what I'm saying? I, of, of being in New York. You know, it was like my first eight years of New York life for me, I was in the city. But when you, you know? came back, it was here. So this no. spot? 
No. When I came back, I lived in the spot. I told you, Fort Green spot. Fort right. Green, you know. So I was there um, prior to coming to the slope. Right. So, um, so yeah, so basically, um, yeah, when that happened, um, you know, um, when we kind of made that separate, like, basically, Matt didn't want me to leave. You know, I think I think in some kind of way he felt like I was abandoning him, abandoning him. Right. Even though I wasn't, you know what I'm saying, and I was trying to bring him along to be a part. But like I said, there was some, there was a life changing situation that happened prior to that that changed him forever, changed everything. Right. You know, all the relationships, all got shook by the situation that he went through personally right. in his family that changed his life and put him in you know it it it, it made things different dynamics so, were shifted all yeah, across the board yeah, right so and it, and, it, and the, yeah so it had a fallout so it was different so basically um so i think that at that time like you know i think in a lot of ways people don't know the background a lot of, me and Matt spent a lot of time together a lot of time together so we had a lot of deep conversations we had a lot of talks about a lot of stuff from family to relationships to our art to music to whatever you know like we really super close super close you know were you guys into the same stuff or were you were you kind of different much of the same stuff like Mm -hmm. a lot of the same thing that's why we really connected in a lot of ways i mean we had different views on certain things but we were definitely into a lot of the same things um and um you know so because of this you know, there was like a certain, we had a certain connection. We we both felt misunderstood. He felt misunderstood. He felt, he felt misunderstood by his family. Mm-hmm. You know, I felt misunderstood. We both felt like we were like kind of like black sheep in a certain way. Like we were misunderstood in a lot of ways. And I think that was one of the things that brought us to connect with each other is because we we both had certain similarities in how we felt like we were like different from even some of the people that we love right you know um so you know yeah so yeah a lot of lot so what of what happens things. in your what's your life like when you well, get back on, from let me, let me finish okay. let me finish so um so to kind of get back to where the things changed so the moment when i left new york to go to atlanta that's when doable arts, like in my mind, doable arts wasn't over. I was still rapping doable arts when I went to Atlanta. I was still speaking as if we were still this artistic force and unit together, you know, and I was still representing us. Cause like in his portfolio and my portfolio, we, we had both our work in there. You know, we had work that we both worked on together. We had work of each other's in there to show the people, you know, like, yeah, you know, this is, we were trying to get work for ourselves and as a unit. Um, but when I left, you know, I think, you know, that was the point when Matt was like, okay, well, he felt like I abandoned him and, um, which I did not, but, but, but so then basically Doable arts kind of changed. It stopped being doable arts, and he created everything's doable. Mm-hmm. Everything's doable is different from doable arts. Everything's doable was Matt do solo, right? And you, you then what? Where, where did you find yourself at that point in time? Because mm. later you had your own uh, started, distinction as well, right? I started Vital Artillery, right? And um, so. When he started, everything's doable. I started vital artillery, and um, and yeah. So then that was my my own personal movement, you know, with right. art. And um, so yeah, and it was crazy because I mean, we were still in touch. And I mean, there was time, I mean, I I I sent Matt money from you know from Atlanta. You know, like I'm like. It's like my brother. I'm going to take care of him. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like, he needs something, I, I got him. You know? Like, you know, it was all it was all good. You know what I'm saying? Like, I didn't realize there was some issue that we were going to get to a point where 
he's not talking to me anymore until I didn't find that out until much later. I mean, I even came back to visit New York before I moved back and we met up, me, him, and our friend Stephanie, who was like really close to him and me, you know, and um, we we all met up together and he, you know, he came to hang out and talk to us, but we both, me and her both recognized that he was different. Something was something was really different. Mm-hmm. And we, and I mean, people were even, even the tone of the time I was away, people would be like, oh, Matt really misses you and blah, 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 and all this stuff. And, you know, but, but his behavior was very different. It was like race, like he was just kind of introverting himself. He was, he was kind of cutting himself off from the people who actually really loved him and cared about him mm-hmm. and he started being more introverted and 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 only person he was really dealing with was his girlfriend. Mm-hmm. And and you know, that's a whole nother thing in itself. Um but um you know, so like uh so yeah so by the time I moved back to New York, which was still that same year me and Matt, we hardly talked. We didn't really talk. Like he wasn't, you know, he was inviting me over to the house, and it was it was really weird. It was like I didn't really understand and get it, and I felt like at that point is when he started to feel like um, he, instead of like the way that we represented for each other and like looked out for each other and trying to bring stuff in for us as a unit, it became more of in his mind, you know. I was I was a threat, mm. you know. Like he he didn't. I don't think he really wanted me to to be illustrating and painting and stuff. But I mean, you can't tell me not to do that. That's no. what I do. I've been right. doing that before I knew him. Right. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, um, and we did this for years together. So it's like, don't you know? You can't. You know. I think that he, you know, started looking at things very. In a very different way, and certainly not the way I was looking at it, you know, because I've always, I was trying to create opportunities for him, even through that time. But, right. but he he was going through some other other things. So, you know, so yeah, so that like we it, it, we had to kind of create that space for each other, you know, and um, so I think by the time I did the body rock piece, you know, that was the straw that broke the camel's back, you know? Really? Yeah, because I felt like, um, you know, he, you know, because I guess, like I told you, we both had our separate, we had our separate ways of working with rockets. Like, we weren't working with rockets together. Like, if you look historically in the past, we worked with labels together as a unit. Yeah, as a team. You, know? you were even, a duo. Even if, even if the job was given to him to do on his own or the job was given to me to do on my own or we did the job together as a unit we you know we we represented ourselves and 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 worked with each other Mm. but after after doable arts kind of separated and you know we kind of drew the line on the ground you know what i'm saying and it wasn't me drawing the line it was him drawing the line but you know i'm like well i'm still gonna do me you know well you kind of have to and um so, it was no love loss. I, 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 you know, I, I, even through the time period when when we didn't speak, there was no love love loss on my end. You right. know what I'm saying? Like I still love Matt. You know. Well, there's and, even a note at the on the back of that tag of the times too that you had written as well. You know. Yeah. Right here, you know. Yeah, that last one. Yeah, because that this one, was probably his one of his last. Pieces. That was the last piece he did before he took his life. Hmm. You know, so this came out after he took his life, and um, so like this is this is the most you read. That's so very cryptic piece. You know that the Tags of the Time version two point oh, like yeah, it's like it's this, uh got a lot of cryptic. of typed pieces and written you know, inscriptions all over the cover. It's uh, it it's like if you know the compilations, the first one has basically has like a sort of tree forest motif this has has a dark uh silhouette of a tree in it but it's 
but it's almost as if the branches are all these like really kind of um, sporadic uh, uh, and very different kinds of thoughts and emotions. It's kind of, uh, it's, 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 it's pretty thought provoking. I mean, you have to really absorb it because there's, there's just a million ideas going on on the page. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot. You know, like I said, it's like, um, you know, we were thinkers, man. I mean, I, I, you know, that's who we are. That's our personality. Like we are thinkers. We're going to challenge things. Plus we were put in environment in, in a school sense in a, you know, when you're in a college or, you know, or for myself also in high school where I went to an art school, like you're in a situation where you have to constantly be critiquing and being critiqued right. every single day. So, you know, everything is about thought provoking situations. So, you know, you have the biggest, greatest gift of art school is that it teaches you to challenge the way you think. Mm. And, to, and that's probably the biggest gift I've gotten out of going to art school. I mean, outside of the technical things that you develop over time, um, in, in the, you know, and also just being able to be around other people and seeing the way they do things. And, you know, you can influence others and be influenced by others. And, you know, you can learn a lot from each other. Um, but, it, but, you know, you also have your own, your own personality. You know, you have to be yourself. You know, you have to always be yourself. You have to always do your own thing and, you know, and just you know, be original. And, um, there's no artist on the planet that hasn't had no inspiration or influence from something else. Oh, of course. Some other experience. So, you know, um, well, that's kind of the beautiful thing is like, you can be inspired by something and create something completely different mm -hmm. in a different medium, mm -hmm. you know? So, yeah. So basically, um, yeah, what ended up happening is, um, you know, like we kind of went our own paths. Um, I did the body rock. I asked to do that. And I wasn't even trying to do the body rock. Like I wasn't even thinking about, I didn't even know about that I was going to have that type of opportunity. Right. What happened was I was with Sean J period because we lived in the same neighborhood and, you know, often be over at his house. Um, me, him and most Steph, at, you know, um, and we would just be like, you know, um, at Sean's Cribs, you know, they recording or whatever, or, you know, whatever. You know, so it was like often what I did, you know, I was hanging out with these guys. And um, Sean had a studio session for the the, the later tracks or, or maybe mix the body rock or whatever. I don't know. Okay. So if you knew me at that time, you know that I, I often walk around with a portfolio mm -hmm. of my work. And, um, like, you're looking at one of the portfolios here. But this is not the earliest ones. The, the really early ones are the doable arts ones that was really smaller ones. And right. I could pull out some of those from the back room. But, but you're seeing the more... This was, like, the more updated vital artillery one that's right. more thick and bigger and more, like, you know... Yeah, I mean, it's an that. incredible body of work. I mean, it's, it's not even something we can cover in a conversation. But the amount of... Of record covers, print ads, uh, logos for artists that people that are totally unfamiliar with, apparel, shirts, and yeah. uh, just so much dope, amazing oh, shit. Going, going. Yeah. But anyway, um, so you know, basically, I went to Sean's house. Sean was like, "You want to come to studio with me?" So you know, we go to the studio. I'm out, I, I think he needed to bring um, some instruments there, so I helped him carry it and whatever, put it in the car. Um, I drove him there, you know. I was driving, you know. I was like the chauffeur, <laughs> and um, and um, yeah. So we went to the studio in the city. Um, actually, that night somebody broke in my fucking car. Well, at least they no, they didn't break in the car. They tried to break in the car. Um, they broke the lock. Damn. They couldn't get in the car. You know, but mm. I have to fucking spend like three hundred dollars to fix the goddamn lock. But um, mm. every time I would go in Manhattan and be in that area late in the studio, 
always someone would tell was it one of those was it that Times Square area of studios up in Times Square or where where were you what no, studio was that that out? was like down like it's probably um it was Green Street downtown yeah. no it wasn't that far downtown it was more like near Battery oh, either okay. either Battery Studio or one of those ones it's like in the 20s right you know yeah over that, over in that direction, there was Barry Studio, but it was another studio over there. So one of those over there. But anyway, so um, went there that night. You know, help him get his stuff in there. You know, he's laying down the track or whatever. Of course, I see um, uh, Danny Castro and Anthony Marshall from Lyricist Lounge. The thing is, you know, me and Danny and and Anthony, we go back. Um, to the doable art days because me and Matt, you know, when we was doing our art and was hitting the streets hard, like we met those guys during our time period, you know. Right. And um, you know, we interact with a lot of people, met a lot of people going back to ninety three, you know, nineteen ninety three. So, um, so it's ninety three, ninety four, you know. 95 we met a lot of people and dealt with a lot of people so we you know three years dual bots was really strong like really banged it out from 93 to you know to 96 before I, I left um but anyway um so body rock time period is later so it's like more like what's that 99 maybe maybe 98. 98 possibly 98 97 98 no, I don't think 90, yeah 98 yeah, maybe ninety eight. So, um, so, so Body Rock is probably ninety eight. So anyway, um, so I'm there with Sean, and I just happen to have my portfolio with me, as I always would. I always would bring my little portfolio with me because I just, you never know. Yeah, of you course. Know? And I wasn't expecting to show it to anyone. I just always just kept it, you know, because people often would ask me. So I was like. When I didn't have it, I was like, fuck, I should just bring it. It's easy to bring, you and know? This is pre-iPad days, so it's obviously, clearly. So it's not like you can quickly show someone your shit on the phone or on an iPad. But. Yeah, and I, and the portfolio was like some big-ass black portfolio. Right, right, right. I mean, it's like I had a, in a silver case. It's really, like, compact and yeah, and, I got and you. pretty, you know, like... And I think even, maybe even at that time, it was just like the book. I think it wasn't even the... It probably wasn't even this one. It was more like the smaller doable art. Well, the ones that stem from the doable arts ones. The one that used, I used to have these books when we first were doing doable arts. I found these books for us to put, make portfolios out of. So we used to use those. And then eventually I, I used those ones for myself. You know, before I upgraded to the nice customized book that you see right. now. Um, but... I think may have been one of the, even these little smaller ones, you know what I'm saying? Because that was like, you know, yeah, you know what? That was like, where was I living at? That was 97. That was still 97, I think, when I was there, to be honest. Because if I was living with Sean, living up the street from Sean, I didn't move to Park Slope until, until the end of 97, going into 98. All right, gotcha. So, so it had to be ninety seven. So, I go to the um, studio with him, and these guys are like, you know, I hadn't seen Danny and, and Anthony in a long time. So, they was like, yo, you know, happy to see me. I'm happy to see them. Whatever we talking, yo, what you been up to, man? Yo, what you know? I mean, at this time, they didn't really even know about my music so much, right? You know, um, well, no, no, that's not true. They actually did know about my music, but they knew about my art longer than they knew about sure. my music. Sure, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. because I actually I did have music on, on the on, on the, the most um, stuff albums. No, no, before that, I had music on the Lyricist Lounge album. Oh yeah, what what joint yeah. was that? What did is you have? Oh, it was a track? freestyle. Right? Yeah, yeah, which is you know wasn't. My favorite track. Were you cutting? Was that you? Were you cutting on that? No, no, I just did a production on right. the track. Um, so anyway, um, so basically, you know, they wanted to see what yo, what you been doing to, up to on the art side. Right. So I guess they were thinking about like what we should do for this cover. I wasn't even thinking about that. I was just there to be with Sean and yeah. you know, just you know, vibe out and you know, see everybody, catch up and shit. 
So anyway, um, they were like, yo, you know, what you up to? And I'm like, oh, well, I got, I can show you a couple things, whatever. So I pulled out the portfolio and they seen the shit I had been doing. They was like, oh shit. They was like, yo, we, you know, we want you to do this. We want you to do the cover of, of, of this record that we, that we're putting down right now in the mm. studio. So I was like, oh, word? Hell yeah. I said, is it you down? I'm like, hell yeah, I'm down. The moment he asked me, I visualized it. I saw this image. Like the moment they asked me, I was in the studio with them, and I'm like, I saw the picture. I was like, shit, I want to do like a. <coughs> I said, the moment I was in the studio, I was like, I want to do like a um, fish eye lens. I see like all of them in the front, and I saw the background. I saw like the city scene. I I, I pictured it. I was like, oh, this is what I want to do. It's like I already have the image. I already know what I want to do. And um. So yeah, so basically that's what I, you know, I had the image and I knew that I wanted to like do a stylized version of all these guys, right. but I wanted to do it in a really like different way. I want to use some of the same techniques with the collage and shit like that. Yeah. Um, but I also wanted to really like caricature style, you know what I'm saying as well. So, so basically... It's a lot of... I don't want to give away all the secrets on how I put it together. Right. Because it's really a lot. A lot of details. Um, but basically, I approached it as two separate things. So, first of all, um, I wanted to, like, do... I wanted to do the faces. Because typically, as an illustrator or as an, as an artist, even in fine art... Um, when I draw a full body, I don't just draw the face. I, 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 I block out and draw the whole body. I okay. get the whole sense of the complete proportions of the body, you know, you know, the reference where this, and even if I'm starting with circles and, and, and rectangles and shit, like I at least will know the, the shape and proportion of the body. But I did it differently here. I wanted to do the faces first separately. Okay. So I started working on faces alone. I started like illustrating faces. And, um, but I was trying to figure out how can I illustrate the faces in a stylized way? You know, I didn't want to just do like straight faces, but I also wanted it to look like the people that I'm illustrating. Right. You know, so I worked on that as a separate thing. Then, separately from that, I was like, I want to create the whole environment. But that has to be a whole separate thing. So, do the environment without the people there. I need to actually create what the environment going to look like. Right. So, I basically... Um, so, if you look at this illustration, and we just ignore the, the, the people in the foreground. We ignore... You know, the artists. This is look at the buildings. So the buildings all came from photographs. Right. But I didn't just use straight photographs. I took separate little parts of photographs. So some photographs I took, you know, were like really small, like really, really tiny. And some were really big. Mm -hmm. So, of course, the resolution is different. Right. And... So when you have resolution that's different, you have textures that's different. And what I wanted to do was create a, a collage using different parts. So part of this, so if you look at this bodega here, you see the top part of the building here? Mm -hmm. I took that from here. Nice, from the opposing building next door to it. Yes. So I took the top part of the, the building next to it and created it and extended it to make it look like a full. So I, as you see, it's longer there than it is here. Right. You know, so I extended it to make it longer. Um, that photo, this bodega was actually from a, a, a actual every, every all these black and part, white parts that's actually um, f came from photos. 
Right. But they were different photos, you know. Photos that you took sizes. or photos that you found? Found photos? Combination. Uh-huh. Some were took, taken, some were found. Gotcha. And so, obviously, the resolutions are different. So, what I ended up doing, you know, some I, I got from magazines and stuff. Gotcha. And cutting, you know, cut, cut and paste and collage. Um, what I did is, at, at SVA, even though I was long graduated from there... Um, because I'm alumni, I, I had access to go in and still use the equipment. Uh-huh. So I would go in and use the equipment because they had these huge, really big photo copiers that you can actually print out shit like really big. Right. You know, so I would blow up like photos that was like really like inches tall right. yeah an inch and or blow two them, and blow them up like much bigger mm-hmm. you know and basically i basically had to blow i had to figure out the different percentages of what to blow things up as or what to shrink things as to make it fit proportionally with the parts that i want to play so basically i had to this the collage is an illustration in itself right so you know because at first when you start off a lot of these things um the the textures are very different because one thing was a higher resolution, so you shrink it down, and still the resolution is better. Where if you have a really small one and you blow it up, the resolution sucks, so it's going to be really dotty and broken sure. up and spotty. So the textures doesn't don't fit if you put those parts together. It's going to look very obvious that that doesn't connect with the other thing. Mm-hmm. So so once I that, once I sized up the pieces and I laid them out the way I need to lay it out and like these buildings, these project buildings that you see here, if you took most out of the way and tash out of the way, it would just repeat the same thing you see in here. It would repeat again behind his head. Right, so you doubled so up. So I basically extended it to make it look like there was more buildings, but it's really coming from the same image. There's a couple of buildings that I... Ex- Change the sizes and made them bigger and bigger and bigger. Right. And connected to together to make it. Oh, uh, it's all the like, same one. Make it, make it like a like a long row of buildings right. going down the street. So we're looking at the top left hand corner of the body rock, twelve inch. For those that might be following along, but um, uh, what's what's dope is that that's an accurate representation of what project buildings look like because they're in a row. They're giant tenements and they all look. Fucking identical. Yes. So you take yeah. one, you duplicate it and make it smaller and smaller to create that depth, depth of field. The depth of field that there's going back and further, you know. So, so that it looks like it's a street. It looks like you're going down Marcy Avenue or whatever street that you choose to think that might be. Exactly. You know? So this image wasn't just like one image. So every part of this came from something else. How in, long in total in do you think parts. it took you? Oh, I worked on the body rock cover for like a month. Okay. Yeah. And, 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 and not in the best conditions either because at the time I was living at the spot, like I told you, um, in Clinton Hill, Fort Greene, um, which was actually my friend owned the building. And I, you know, when I came back from Atlanta in 96, I moved in there because he had a space open in the basement where I could, you know, I could, I could live. But he was actually doing renovations on the building. So he was stripping a lot of the, the old paint shit off the wall to get back down to the original wood and he was just trying to like really like he just bought this building and he was telling he had a he had a couple tenants upstairs and he lived in there at the top floor but um he gave me the bottom floor but it was cold it didn't have a real bed i slept on a fucking air mattress Dang. that would the air would like every oh, night come out yeah every night i had to wake up in the middle of the night and repunk the bed up because mm-hmm. i end up on the floor you know, it was it was yo, it was like people don't do. understand like the conditions that I painted this shit was not easy. That's a true artist right like, there. It was rough, you know what I'm right. saying? And then especially I was sharing that space also with my girlfriend at the time too, mm. who eventually, you know, she moved up to New York to to you know, from Atlanta to live with right. me. You know, and, you know, not at first, but eventually she moved up and then she was living in that space with me too. Right. So you know, it was it was it was a, it was a challenge, man. It was a challenge. But anyway, um, so yes, yeah, so well, I created this whole. So I had to like create the like effect of of um, 
had to distort it to make it look like it was fish islands. Right. Because these pictures weren't originally a fish island. Right. You had to actually photo. distort and, and uh, bend them a little bit. I had right. to bend them. I had to do all these crazy tricks and techniques. Yeah. With the copy machine, with my hand holding. Oh, it. holding it and bending yeah, it. Yeah, lot of That's lot tight. of lot of crazy shit. No, no computer with that shit. That was like really all like copy. But this drawing. too. But even the um, even the characters too. Yeah, no, it's not no computer with the body rock at all. That's amazing. You know? That's so, so dope, man. So anyway, That's... um, so it was all copy, right. cut, paste. And illustration were, paint. Were there any issues using all those logos? You had Adidas, Starter, no. Echo, and and uh, Kango. No, no, that's fresh. No. Um. So um. So yeah. So once I created this background, like once I I got it right to get like the the buildings and all the shit in the background, I knew that these guys would overlay some of that. So some of the things I didn't want to be seen, like these cars that you see here, they would be back here behind his head. Uh, Um, I knew you wouldn't see them by the time I put most there in the foreground. So I was like, I had to get everything in the right position to create the effect of proper, you know, perspective. Right. You know, so, um, so I got that down first. But then still, the textures are, are were not matching. Like certain things are like really smooth, and other things are really dotty and broken up and like you know pixel pixelated. So basically, what I would do to get everything to start to blend together is I just copy it on the copy machine, and then take the copy and copy the copy on the copy machine, and then copy the copy on the right. copy machine, and then cop- and before you know it, eventually. The the resolution breaks down where everything starts to look the same. Right. And yeah, I love that. So that was a big part of of how I got this to feel and look like it's just a real background. Right. You know? Um and it was a lot of it took a lot of time, it took a lot of copies. Yeah, know? the copy style, cut and paste, black and white copy style, it, it is time consuming but the but the end <coughs> product is always super cool. The, the textures the yeah. kind of uh, the just the the feeling of it uh, and the fact that it's these black and white uh, very familiar kind of Brooklyn buildings with this bright orange and yellow and they all got the bright blue royal blue primary colors on the on their on the gear it just it's a great uh, marriage of color right there oh thank you man yeah thank um, you so anyway so going back to now I have this background it's kind of laid out I kind of see the space and see what I'm working with now I can see the environment that these guys need to go in so now I got to get them together so I worked on getting the, the illustration of the faces together to try to at least get their likenesses somewhat down um, then from there I started putting their faces onto a page that had a lot of big page where I could actually draw out the bodies. Mm-hmm. So then I started drawing out the bodies and, um, and once I could draw out the bodies, I did it. I did them all separately. And, um, and yeah, and once I got it, got it kind of right, then I would, you know, I would copy it and copy it. And then I would cut out the body that, once I got everything the way I wanted to, sized it where I needed to be, and I overlaid it um, on top of the 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 background with this in the city scene, you know. And mm-hmm. then I did the same thing for each one of those, you know. I did the same thing for Moe's, for Taz, and for, and for um for Q Tip, and um so once I had them all laid out. You know, on top of the bot, on top of the buildings and everything. Then I pasted it all down, had the sizing right and everything, still in black and white, nothing in color yet. Then I took that and copied it again. Nice. So then I copied it. So then now I have everything flat. So I have multiple copies of it, you know. And and then I basically took that and I mounted it onto an illustration board. And... And then I started painting over mm. what I... Oh, so it originally... Finally, when you started painting, it was all uh, one big black and white canvas. Is that what it... This was already intact? It was intact. The city scene was so, already a part of the canvas. It yes. wasn't like you... 
because obviously because you're not using Photoshop or any kind of computer Adobe thing, right? Like you have to create the canvas first and then you begin painting on top of it, right? Yes, yes. I put everything in. I want everything to be flat. You know, I didn't want it to be like, I didn't want the, um, like the hat and all that stuff, the whiteness of the hat and all that stuff to, to be raised. Right. I wanted, I just wanted it to be flat, like, you know, blocked out in front of the buildings and stuff like that. Um, mm. The only thing that I added on top of this was the new level of collages, which was the gold chains right. and all that stuff and all the jewelry and everything. I started pasting that on too and all the logos and stuff. I pasted onto the actual painting once I started painting. What do you? What were you using? Just glue with a paint with a brush or something? Or do you remember? Is um, it, that's not actual scotch tape or anything like that. No right? tape. No, no, no. I um I I, I use different types of. Oh, because of it has to be like it's still there. It still exists, right? To as of today. I mean, it's yeah. it's a part of the painting. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So the collages are still there. Yeah, the the jewelry and everything right, right, of course and the, and the other stuff some of the jewelry i painted on too like the tash's ring and stuff like that right. that was illustrated this to the most stuff and the belt most right? belt and um you know certain things what like about actually, q-tip's hat that looks like an actual hat like a like it look doesn't look like it was painted i think i painted that yeah. one yeah yeah um, that's good because it does yeah. look like almost like a photocopy, but it, you could you could go either way because it is a it's basically just blue and white, uh, yeah. uh, you know, um, image I guess you know. But yeah, it's it's dope. I mean, I, I appreciate us being able to break it down. It's kind of interesting to be able to break it down just in audio only. You know, usually nowadays everything is so visual, so yeah. people have to either use their imagination, get the record off out of the crate or off the, uh, you know, pull it out the back wall, look it up online and see. It's the Body Rock uh, 12 inch, which was a most deaf record featuring Tash and Q-Tip uh, released as part of the Lyricist Lounge compilation that came out on Rockus Records like in the late 90s. The other thing though, to, to relate this back to, going back to our beginning of this whole interview, to production stuff, and pause button tapes. So pause button tapes really taught me how to like um, move my timing and um, and being really ex exact with things. Right. You know where you couldn't hear the edits. It was really smooth. Um, Precise. So really the precision, the precision of it. So um, that. In a, in a way is also similar to what I do visually you know it's a like certain precision to making everything fit and work mm. together in a particular way um, but production wise what that helped me do is so in my early days of production before I had 4 tracks and 8 tracks and 16 tracks and 24 tracks um, I had 0 tracks I just had cassette tapes yeah so i would overdub overdub things but what i learned about overdubbing is that when you overdubbed um in cassettes it would speed up the recording a little bit each time so even I, I when you would go over something yeah you mean? i would like so if i if i let's say I, I was making so this is what i would do so basically what i noticed is if i want to produce a track and it's going to take like four recordings, four passes to go by of, of, of adding a new layer of instrumentation. Um, each time I did a new overdub, it would speed it up a little bit. So by the time I got to the fourth recording, the fourth and final pass, the music had speeded up considerably. Mm. So basically, at that point in time... Um, you know, the, I couldn't, it doesn't sound the same. It's out of key. It's in a new key now. You know, the, right. the, the pitch has changed. So anytime something speeds up or slows down, it changes the pitch unless you, unless, you know, unless like nowadays you have the technology of being able to, um, you know, to do a, a you like can a, adjust the pitch along yeah, with Yeah, you can right? do, you can do like, you know, um, you can you know time shift it in a way in where you can s slow things down um 
and keep it in the same pitch, right. you know. But that's that's digital shit because digital stuff. That's a complicated thing about digital versus analog. So digital is really just pixels, pixels of um, well, in visual, it's like pixels of dots. What, what creates images? Mm-hmm. So you look at newspaper. News newspapers are just very pixelated because it's just like pixels the the more dots that are there the the finer and the better the re- resolution is going right. to be but if you don't have a lot of pixels the resolution is less and it, it's more broken up mm-hmm. you know it's kind of like how the background of this body rock the city scene is more like it's more pixelated it's more you know. pixelated, but it creates the it creates illusion. The depth. It creates depth in the, in the illusion of brick and cement building. Exactly. It gives it texture, texture. that makes it. Exactly. Yeah. And then that was done purposely because right. I knew that that would push that back. You know? Right. And the colors and the vibrant and the very, like, solidness of painting these guys in front of that will bring them forward. So right. it creates depth. It feels an illusion of, of, of depth, you right. know? And, um... So anyway, when it comes to um, my recording, my, my earliest recording, um, I learned the lesson that okay, so each time it speeds up when I actually record, do a new overlay when I'm doing like overdub. So I needed to start figuring out like how many recordings would it take for me to finish a song. Mm. So some of the earliest production that I did, I would actually slow. I would I would slow down. I had to like to figure out how much I need to slow the tempo down on the drum track. Because I start with the drum track. I will program a drum a drum track, slow down the, the 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 BPM, slow down you know slow it down so it's actually slower than I want it to be. And and have wow. to guesstimate how each overlay, like how many tracks, so let's say I, I need eight recordings. So let me slow this shit down according to what I think the percentage it needs to be slowed down. So by the time after eight overdubs, it would actually be back at the proper speed, you know? And um, so I had to do that. So basically I had to slow down the, the tempo on the drums, um, and then I had to pitch down the keys on the on the on the keyboards and right. uh, anything I was playing, and I would play shit all the way through. I would play all the all the chords and keys all the way through. Or when you play. don't have multi tracks, you kind of yeah, you have to. Right? I had to extend it, yeah, because I didn't have a way to edit it, so I had to like do it all the way through. I had to do the bass all the way through. I had to do everything all the way through each 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 pass. So by the time I got to the final recording, it would be back up to speed and the pitch would be back up to where it's supposed to be. But I started at a place where I had to pitch it all the way down where it's not sounding the way I wanted to right, sound. Right, right. You know, I had to figure those type of things out. It's all problem solving. Really, right. all of this shit at the end of the day is problem solving. You know, yeah. and that's one of the biggest thing the art school taught me. And it's something that I use actually to help me in music. Mm. Yeah, well, so. I mean, you applied it there, especially when you're working with kind of primitive gear or your early first setups. So you have to you have to be that innovative. Yeah, and that in an in- interesting way, actually started before I was in art school. You know what I'm saying? So it really dates back before art school. But art school taught taught me how to fine tune it and to really utilize it in a way right. that was beneficial to everything in my life. Right. Now, obviously, we haven't even talked about your production stuff at all, and uh, I want to. I'd like to. Uh, we can't do a five-hour episode because i got to go have dinner soon. But I do want to talk. see if we can brush over um, a couple of little things really quickly and maybe tentatively you know, uh, see if we pick this up uh, for even more stuff later. But I do want to – there's a lot of shit I want to cover, you know. I'd love to know really just about your work with most stuff this and the song you did on black on both sides and just if if that if that's a if there's a quick way to talk about that I, I doubt that there is because you guys have done a lot of other work together I mean you also did multiple covers of of his too you know some other 
artwork. But specifically, we can hone in just on that particular song only, knowing that y'all you have history together and it's all that. It's hard to say that because if you really want to go back to how me and Moe's really connected, our first musical collaboration is a song that never came out that I still have called Great Day. Mm. And Moe's is singing on the whole song. Dope. And, um... And I still have it, and he, and it was when his first daughter was born. Mm, you know, after amazing. his first daughter was born, so, um, which was his first kid. You know what I'm saying? Sure. Chandani. So, um, which is that is a very complicated thing too, because it's just the depth of the history. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, that but, sounds um, yeah. But but basically. Um, we did this track and everybody like so basically there's a studio so when i lived on clinton avenue down the street from me on clinton avenue was my man ot overtime mm. ot's oh he was in medina green right or no no no, no. my bad but he but but medina green and myself and most and you know mr man khalil um maceo from de la soul like um, um, all of us recorded songs like Wordsworth, Jean Grey. Before she was Jean, Jean Grey, she was what, what, what? Right. Um, you know, um, it was the studio where we all recorded that. So you know, so it was a real Brooklyn movie, Pumpkinhead, and you know, rest in peace. You know, mm -hmm. like like this real the Brooklyn crew. You know, what I'm saying like down the street from where I live. So. We spent a lot of time at OT's crib, you know. Sean J, you know, all of us, we were there. We all recorded there. So, OT's crib is very important for our movement, you know. To really, you know, like, it, that was a really, it was like a very artist central place. And a lot of in he was down with natural resource then, right? Was was he not? I yeah, don't want to strike yeah, out. Yeah, with, yeah, uh, yeah. I think I mean, it's all that's all. Yeah, it's connected. It's all connected. It's all connected. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was just trying to put two and two together. Yeah. So um, so yeah, so we were basically you know at OT's crib, you know, and um, so that was the first time that most and I you know did a song together, and we played that shit there and people I mean it, you don't understand like it was like everyone was buzzing off of that shit mm. that me and most did and that was our first collaboration um to take it to Brooklyn and you talk about Brooklyn from um black on both sides um you know that's not our first collab that's not our first collaboration nor is it our second because you know I was on a black star album as well of course you know um, B boys will be boys uh, with most and Qua and high tech on the on the cuts, um, um, but um, but yeah, um, black on both sides. Uh, to the Brooklyn thing is a it's a it's a touchy subject for me. Mm. Um, the reason I say this is because initially Brooklyn. Is the original version of Brooklyn is not the one that ended up on the album. Oh, gotcha. Okay, I didn't know that. Yeah. So the original version of Brooklyn is actually a, a most has three verses all the way through the song, mm. whereas on the album, it's three suites within the song, which is three different beats, three different productions, three different producers. Mm. Basically. You know what I'm saying? Mine is just the intro part. Right. Then it cuts into mine and then starts a new thing and then starts a new thing. And that was not a decision that I made. That was a decision that most made that I wasn't happy about. Well, you sure. Know? I mean, and I wasn't song. told about it either. I found out about it because Spinner told me about it. Spinner knew how the original song was. And by the time he got an early copy of the album before it came out, you know, he called me up was like yo man the, your version of the song got changed so mm. I came over to the crib to hear it cause I hadn't had a copy of the album yet mm. and um and most was actually heading over to his crib that day and um 
So he's like, yeah, Moses coming over for a session because I think they were working on the Ronnie Jordan shit at that time. Mm-hmm. You know, rest so, in peace. Right. You know what I'm saying? So, um, so basically, I waited for most. I I basically um, waited in the cut. Most didn't know I was gonna be there, and I basically, um, you know, kind of like ambushed them. You know, mm. as finished credit. You know about it. So, um, so yeah, basically, you know, it was already too late by that time. Yeah, it was already was like pretty out. much about to, it was already ready to come out. So, like, I was pissed off because to give you the real depth and the real story behind Brooklyn, Brooklyn wasn't even supposed to be on the album at first. It was supposed to be a, a single. It was going to be a maxi single that gotcha. Rockets was going to put out. They were really excited about it. With me and that track that me and most did it was gonna be a single um in in its full entirety mm. and um but something happened and it just took a lot of time and it never you know something held it up and it just never it didn't never happen like that so instead they decided we're gonna put it on the album instead mm. you know and we also in the first place when we first started it we didn't even fully complete it. We started at I think Cut and Rim Studios, um, down on Broadway, um, Lower Manhattan. But we finished Brooklyn. Um, well, no, we actually worked at three different studios. The second time we f- we started to to finish the verse, he only put the first verse and a half verse um, when we did it at Cut and Rim. Right. But we didn't complete it. Um, and then we also started another track that we didn't complete. Um, I still got the two-inch reels for that. Um, but then um, we worked at the at um, uh, Fast Forward Studios with my man Elliot and them. Um, and most came in. That was the day that most came in to finish the verses for Brooklyn. So we had to transfer everything from two inch tape over to Pro Tools. So we had to first do the wow. transfer, you know, and then once we did that, then we had most come in and finish his his verses for it. But we didn't mix it. We just finished. We just finished the lyrical shit. But also Diamond D came in that day to drop his beats for. Uh, for most also right. for the album because at this point I knew it was going to be on the album um, so Diamond D came in and um, but he didn't have uh, he didn't have his MPC with him and um, so he he bought my MPC so I let Diamond D use my MPC to drop to, to track his beats mm, for most interesting too. okay um, and we you know we were all that was the first time me and Diamond D got to meet and got to, you know, got to connect, you know. Later, much later on, I went to his crib in Jersey and when he was, like, living in Jersey and stuff like that and all that, whatever. But right. anyway, um, but it was interesting that night because I had a lot of questions for him because I was asking him stuff about, you know, that, you know, Diamond D and the Psychotic Neurotics, um, you know, that the album they put out was, you know, I banged that album to death it's, you know? yeah one of the few tapes I broke from listening so many times uh, <laughs> it's like one of my it's one yeah, of my top top three hip hop beautiful it's yeah. beautiful you know it's the introduction to Fat Joe to the world right and a lot of you know it was a really dope album really I still love that album to this very day and um so Blunt Stunts is it Stunts Blunts and Hip Hop yeah Stunts Blunts and Hip Hop yeah, yeah. So that's like one of my favorite albums. So anyway, great samples, great songwriting. He was a great. He's a great songwriter. He's, I feel like for he's dope. stories, lots of the stories and shit. Diamond's dope, man. Diamond, you know, Buck Wild, you know, what I'm saying like um, Showbiz. I mean. A lot of those cats, man, I really like what they were doing. And, you know, also Lord Lord Finesse, Lord Finesse, you know, um, even Farrell March, really dope beats. You know, I I was at Farrell House many times hearing beats on the MP, you know, on the 
on, on the um on the SP twelve hundred and the S nine fifty. You know oh. what I'm saying? And um. You know, because that, that was like the great combination back in the day was like the S950 with the, you know, in, in the Akai joint with the um, with the SP1200. You get the raw drums and bass on the SP and then you get the sample shit on the, right. on the S950. You know, like, Lord Professor was the, was the, was the god of that. You right. know what I'm saying? Like that the shit he was doing um, was real, was real major with that. Um, but, um... You know, but also I think about Pete Rock. You know what I'm saying? Like, Pete... Oh, we can keep going. Pete with the SB... I mean, you know, I... I like, because me and... Me and um, Pete's, you know, younger brother... Um, you know, we... We got close, you know. And, um... So... You know... Gra- you know, Grap Lover. So, Shouts to Grap Lover. Yo, Grap, Grap, Grap! I just saw I saw him in D.C. a couple uh, months man, ago. I miss you, Grap, man. I hope to see you soon, my brother. Um, that's that's my dude, you know what I'm saying? So me and Grap got close, especially after he went, he moved to Maryland, you know. So I would go see family in Baltimore, and then I would drive out. You know, he lived much further away, but I would drive down to see him, check him sometime. Right. One time... I went to scoop him and I was coming back to Brooklyn but he was like yo I want to go up to New York you know what I'm saying so we rode together on a car so I drove him up I went down to pick him up scoop him we drove back up we stopped by the crib and, and, and you know here where you are now um, BK drop off some shit and then we continue up to go to Pete's crib oh, and nice. it was snowing and shit so, you know, I ended up staying the night at, at, at Pete's crib. And Pete took us out for breakfast and stuff like that. Oh, that's what's Riding up. around, you know, in his truck. And, like, he just playing beats that he been. And just, that's, just all kinds of heat, man. Just, like. He's so incredibly Pete's talented, stuff. man. You know, so, so that's, you know, you know, I got to really get to, you know, start to meet, you know, Pete through Grap. You know what right. I'm saying? Well, and, you guys um, also collaborated in that. You did an incredible Remix. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, it's two. It's two records of that actually. What was the other man. one with Pete Rock? I mean, that's two, no. They're the same song. Oh yeah. For, so but, it's Grand but, Agent and Pete Rock was the yeah. record that came out on Groove there Attack. There was one right? that yeah, they both came on Groove Attack. Right. But basically, I gave Groove Attack the, the second one that Groove Attack put out. I told them in the very first time to put it out the first time. Right. But they didn't want to put out that version. They wanted to put out the other ones they put on that record, which was not my favorite version of the song. No, I the like, one that's on Geology Plays Geology is the joke. That was the one. That was the one I told them to put on. I didn't yeah. want the other ones on there. They was like, nah. Because, and, and, and this is like with the guys from, you know, and I love I love Group Attack. Those are my peoples and all. But at the time, they was on some like, wow, nah, we want to use the other one because you, you know, it has a sample of Last Night Teens at all in it, whatever. And um, they were just sick of hearing that song. But I'm like, oh, it's wow. not used in that kind of way. Like, listen to the right. way I chopped you it up. It. Yeah. You know, like, and it, you know, so in the in the, and then the the Herbie and all the way I chopped all that shit up was crazy. You know, like that I was, couldn't even tell that that's what that's what's in the record. That was the one, man. Yeah. And I kept telling them, but they didn't want to hear that. They wanted to put out the ones they did, and I and I felt like that was a big mistake. Which it was, I felt. You know, even though they, their record did well and it was good, it to me, it, it's like everyone was always choosing the beats that I didn't want them to choose. I'm like, no, this is the beats. This <laughs> is the, I would right. tell these motherfuckers what beats to choose. This is the one you need to choose. Right. But they didn't want to listen. Right, right, Until it. years later, when, you know, basically, um, Grand Agent was putting out an album, plus, um, you know... The other guys was also putting up, putting together a compilation that had one of the Grand Agents joints on there too. Um, basically, when they they heard it again, it was like losing their mind. Like it was the first time they heard it, and I'm like, "Y'all heard this shit years ago, and you didn't want to use it." Right. You know what I'm saying? But they were losing their mind. Like, oh, we gotta put it. We gotta put this out. We gotta do it. So like, basically, I was ahead of the curve, and that's and that's why I feel like I've always kind of been in the situation where. At the time, I would make something. It's too early. People weren't ready for it. It it took years to go by before people actually 
was ready for the shit that I put out. Like the stuff I did with Vinny and Mojica. I, I made all those beats when I was in Atlanta, man. Right. Guilt Junkie is incredible. So. Well, well, not all of them. Like, the Guilt Junkie I made in Atlanta in 96 when I left. Wow. You know what I'm saying? The that other, still stands to this day. That's still a record you can play to this day. It's, it's no, kind of timeless. Yeah, so I put that out. I mean, I, I made that in 96. What, what, what year did the video thing come out? Like, 2003 or something? Something like that. So, yeah. it's like... Maybe it, a little bit earlier. It took years to go by before... It made sense for people, right, you know right, what I'm saying, right. and so the same thing happened with with that remix. Like the second the second record they put out, it was me on one side and King Brit on the other side with re, remixes, and um and that's the one. Yeah, that's that's the joint, man, and that was the one that they should have put out in the first place. And another incredible remix that I you know I really want to talk about in this conversation is is the one you did uh, that was Wajid and, and Dilla. The record where where it's, it's Jay Dilla rhyming, but it yeah. was a, I it was a Platinum Pie Pipers, I think was the yeah, original yeah, it was record. It was right? a PPP record. That yeah. fucking that remix, because it's because with and the Rich sample, Medina, Rich Medina did one on that record too. Nice, yeah, yeah I got yeah. the single, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean that was yeah. It was Can just, you speak on it just for a sec? I mean, I know it's just a remix, but still, it's such a. But he, but Dilla sounded, he just sounded incredible on that, and with the cuts on it, it was just a classic kind of. Hip hop of that of that era hits the target like right in the middle. Oh, I'm um, thank you, man. I mean, I was just trying to do something good. You know, YG is my family. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? The, and Dilla, I mean, you know, yo, like so I could go on so such a tangent when I talked about talk about JD. You know what I'm saying? Like he is the reason why I know. YG in the first place. Wow. Like, basically, taking it back to the portfolio, like I told you about how I had my portfolio, going to Lyricist Lounge um, studio session, you know, for um, Body Rock with Sean J. Period. Basically, um, probably n- around that same year, 97, um, I had uh, went to a studio session yeah, it was a studio session I did with Most that I had to track some beats from Most, and and then, um, and then JD also came through to track some beats from Most. Okay. I think maybe that was probably for the the Brooklyn. I think it was the Brooklyn joint. Mm. It may have been that session. Maybe when I may have been that session. Um, originally when I did. I first did the the early tracking you know, before it was even going to be on the album. It was just going to be a a, a, a maxi single. Um, I met JD because he came in. It was me, eighty eight keys, and in in JD or AKA J Dilla. He wasn't J Dilla at that time. Was right, JD. correct. Um, so um, he came to that session. I think that was at Cutting Room Studios, and. Um, and we hung out. We clicked. We clicked immediately, you know, because you know, first of all, we're producers and we love music and right. stuff like that. And um, and I had been following what he'd been doing, and you know, knew about his stuff, and I was a fan of what he was doing too. Um, but you know, we met, we clicked. I had my artwork with me, so we didn't just talk about production as you would expect. You know, we we definitely talked about production stuff, and you know. And, and, you know, talked about certain little things with each other, technical stuff about production mm-hmm. with each other. But more importantly, he asked me about what was in that, that portfolio that I had. And I, and I showed it to him, and he was like, he lost his shit. He was like, oh, shit. Like, he was like, really was digging my artwork. Cool. So, you know, his, his, his uh, manager at the time, Tim Maynor, you know, Tim, <laughs> my man Tim. What up, Tim? You know what I'm saying? Um, but anyway, um, so yeah, so he called Tim over and he was like, "Yo, man, check this shit out. You gotta check this shit out. You gotta check this shit out." So he showed Tim, and then he was like, they were both bugging. He was like, "Oh shit," you know. So that's how we got in with each other, like really from '97. Me and me and JD got cool, got super cool. And, um, so he was like, looked at my book and he was like, yo, man, you get down like how we get down. You know what I'm saying? Like he said, yo, I got to introduce you to my brother. 
Gangs to my brother. And um and I was like, oh word, word. He, he does art? And he said, Yeah, yeah, my man he said, Yeah, yeah, my my man Jay he says, My man on YG, you know, you got you gotta you gotta um I gotta introduce you to y'all gotta see mm. each y'all gotta know each other. So yo, he told me that that day. He told me that like, you know, that I need to meet, you know, YG. Wow. And um and the funny thing is, because you know, I saw that I just saw YG in uh, Miami recently oh down in um down in um uh, for um art basil you know last last early december just last month or so and um basically um you know we had a quick moment we talked about this and and you know but also yj told me this before he was like it's so funny because after that trip when he came back from new york you know um, JD told YG the same thing about me. He was like, YG it was like, JD was like, yo, telling him about me that he need to meet me. Nice. So, so that's why it was really impressive for me when I met YG because I met him when basically it was around the time that, that Tropical Quest decided that they were going to retire as a group. Right. And, um, so it was when it was their so called last show in New York, right? Uh, dude, I think I, I was it at and, Tramps, and and mm, I, it was at the I think it was uh, uh what's this the thing on 34th Street, the um the ballroom, what is it called? The Hammerstein, oh, Hammerstein Ball. Ballroom, I think, gotcha. it, right. I think it was Hammerstein, right, right. I think it was Hammerstein Ballroom, right? Um and Slum Village was on that show. Nice. With them. And um and basically, um so Slum Village was on that show and YG came with them. Mm. And when J D saw me, he was like, Yo, 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 remember I told you about he said, Yo, I, my man's here, I told you I was gonna introduce you. He's here, he's here. I wanna show I wanna, come, I'm gonna introduce you. Come 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 here. He wow. took me and introduced me to YG. <laughs> that's so crazy. that's how me and YG met through Jay Dilla. Um, the, the the first time I met JD, like basically, that's what he told me. He was gonna, you know, introduce me to YG. So it was really, mm-hmm. he didn't forget. You know what I'm saying? Like he kept his word and he told me. And you know, so when I I met him, like we clicked and um and we all hung out at the after party after the show and. Yeah, it was fun. It was it was it was good. So that was like the beginning of my relationship with YG. You mm. know, started. And you guys have done a lot together. I mean, lots of gigs together. I mean, lots of and the, and of course, my family. Right, absolutely. And Blame Forty Seven. That was his imprint too, right? Which is what that record came out from. Yeah. Now he's at um, Dirt Rec Tech. You know, what yes. I'm saying? And um, you know, he's back in the D, back in Detroit. And you know, I, I came to Detroit with him and we DJed in Detroit together um you know we've, we've had a lot of experiences you know in different from Detroit to New York to you know Miami you know and um I have this great photo I took of D nice taking a picture of of you and YG DJing together at um Opus 22 I think do you remember that spot Oh, um, uh, or yeah. I think it's on. It was on that West Side Highway. Did so, nice took that picture? Yeah, it's a picture. It was right when he first started coming out doing oh, <clears throat> photos. I you know, need to see that picture. It's great because it's a it's a photo where D Nice is taking in the flash hits. I love taking pictures like this where, where I took the picture with his flash. Where can I see this picture? I got it. Uh, I'll email it to you. Oh, please, please do, yeah. man. Yeah. It's funny because you know D Nice came here at this crib. Him and uh, Ralph McDaniel's Uncle really, Ra- Uncle Ralph, Uncle Ralph, um, a legend. And they took they took pictures of me in the studio here, back. When, yeah, it was like in the early parts of D Nice taking his photos. He took a picture of me. He put me put a picture of me in his photo show Dope. that he had. But he had me he had me like rhyming on the mic and took a picture of me. <laughs> what? And I don't, okay, I don't rhyme yeah. anymore. Right. You know what I'm right. saying? But um, but huh. yeah, right. it's um. Yeah, you know, it's, a, it's you know, it's such a small world like it's all right. connected, you know. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we could keep putting so many uh things uh together in the course of this conversation. I do need I need to wrap this up. Yeah. Um but there's it's always tomorrow. There is. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we can we can go there. 4 o'clock. 
<laughs> Four o'clock? Is that what you said? Possibly. Let's see what's up. <laughs> okay. Why don't we? Why don't we? Yeah. Why don't we? Yeah. Why don't we tentatively try to do that? Because um, yeah. Because I I, I want to talk about Detroit more. I want to talk about the record you put out last year on Sound Signature and, and and the evolution of your music up to this point too. You know, I love to talk about the record that we did together and the, yeah. and the. Uh, formative tour we went on together with me you Sadat X and Greg Nice of Ren, uh, uh, of Nice and Smooth yeah and yeah, um, yeah. so yeah because I'm already yeah I'm like at three hours plus right now so man we can keep going you know how it goes <laughs> I know well um, but I think we I know you know I think we're at a good we're at a good point right now there's there's so much to cover there's so much art to cover and, and so many records but we did uh yeah it would be good too if we do end up discussing the t- detroit thing because this is another thing that's been happening recently um which has been kind of troublesome for me um is that there's people have been trying to like um bill me as from detroit in some of the bookings that i've you know on flyers and shit you know, in Europe and stuff like that without people, you know, and I'm like, how the fuck they get that mixed up? You know what I'm saying? It's like, and um, so I did get asked about this in the interview I did with um, The Standard because uh, I just played the gig back in December at the at Le right. Bon. Um, so I had to, you know, I had to really just sort of really address it because I've addressed it before. If you see my social media, you definitely know I've addressed it because I, I, I can't stand it when people are like, you know, making up shit. You know, like there's the information is out there. The real information is out there. So there's no need to like make up some shit. You know what I'm saying? Right, right. But, um, you know, and I think that, you know, just people just need to be clear. Like, you know, I'm. I'm I'm originally from Baltimore. I'm born in Baltimore, but you know, like my teenage years started in Baltimore and continued in New York. You know right. what I'm saying? So it's like, you know, that New York and Baltimore are the cities that have raised me. Yeah, so. absolutely. I mean, you're definitely a New Yorker as well as as uh, you know, uh, from Baltimore. I mean, you've yeah. been here now for quite a while. I mean, yeah. and, and worked with so many people in New York. But yeah, I've lived in New York. Most of my life. I mean, it's almost 30 years now. You know wow. what I'm saying? Yeah. And, um, I mean, I haven't lived in Baltimore since I was a teenager, you know? So, I moved to New York. I was still 17 when I moved to New York. So yeah. That's I, when I moved to New York, you know, too. So, so, I was like, you know, I was still a teenager at the time. And, um, you know, I was still young, you know? So, um, well, you've come, we've come a long way. We, we've covered a lot. And let's try to pick this up again and might turn this into a two-parter uh, um, and let people really be able to absorb everything, man. But I appreciate all your time, man. You took a lot of time out of your day-to-day for me. Brother, Thank you. Any time for you, man. Your family, man. Thanks go, so much. We go back like spinal cords. <laughs> yes. Yes, indeed. All right. Cool, man. So uh, I'll be seeing you tomorrow then. <laughs> sure. no all right. Cool. Yes. How about that? That was an amazing conversation with my man, Geology, G. Young, Gerard Young, my neighbor, my friend here in Brooklyn. Uh, what an incredible talk. Uh, just being able to break down the 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 one record. I could have, there were so many other records that he's designed um, that we obviously couldn't talk about everything, but just talking about the that body rock record the Mosef Q-Tip and Tash uh, a classic indie hip hop single of the mid 90s late 90s um, and being able to talk about that in the audio format so you're really forced to use your imagination to create the visual for yourself is um, kind of a rare treat uh, to work that muscle too and just talking about the history of doable arts and the fact that these guys did so many um, wholly unique, incredible designs, um, cut and paste, mixed media, painting and illustration with no computers. And it doesn't, that wasn't that long ago. And to do all that by hand uh, with, you know, finessing uh, uh, copy machines and, and cutting and um, slicing and mixing it with acrylics and oil paints and 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 
markers and pens and uh it's just dope and it, and it plays into even his style of production too and that classic style of, of production in general um i also wanted to say at the very beginning of the podcast i played a, a snippet of a joint classic song um uh geo had mentioned uh, dj spinna who was obviously a producer dj uh, who has a group called the Jig Masters, uh, and in their seminal debut album, uh, Geology, a place a, a produced a song called Reality Check. So that was a, a snippet, an instrumental version of that song, which I use as the opener. I always love that song. I love that album. Um, I even co-directed a music video for that uh, album. If you ever saw the music video for Don't Get It Twisted with the Dot X. Um, I directed that with my friend Wendy Morgan, 2001, you know what I'm saying? So, uh, but yeah, just talking to Gio was great. Um, this is going to be a fun one for me to revisit too down the line. I'm definitely going to listen to this one again. I know that we'll do a part two uh, in the future as well because we, we didn't get to talk about anything in a contemporary sense. Um, but just hearing the story of meeting JD and how that connected him with Wajid and those two guys are great collaborators. Uh, the time with Tupac is just an unbelievably personal uh, story. I'm so grateful that he could share that and be down and open to. So thank you so much to Geology for, for sharing all that, all those great stories and for giving me his time. And to um, CJ Stewart, for the editing and the production uh, assistance on the engineering. Thank you so much, my man. Uh, here's to another great episode. You have been listening to The House List. This is my weekly podcast. I My name is Peter Agassi, and I, I produce it, and I hosted it. Um, you know, I'm doing this on the DIY level, so if, if you enjoyed it, you know, uh, copy the link, send it to a friend, or, or if you see it on SoundCloud, repost it on your page. You know, just uh, help spread the word. That's all. That's all I ask. It's a free thing. I do it for free. I do it for the love. Um, and it is uh, something I'm going to continue doing. Uh, if all, if everything falls in place and works out right, um, this coming week, next week rather, the following episode, um, which I think will be episode 17, 16, um, will, will be a great companion to my talk with geology. So hang tight for that. If you like this talk, look out for next week. And uh, I think I'm going to close the show out with a brand new joint from Gio um, that he uh, hit me with. Said, yeah, you can play, play a little snippet of it. I asked very nicely. I, I thank you for that. It's called Nomadic Disorientation. So check this out. This is this is the type of shit. If you, if you see him out now, these are some of the new. This is a new original production of his. Um, if you have a chance to see him DJ, I highly recommend it too. It's always a good time. So check out this joint. I'm going to let it ride a little bit. Thank you guys so much for tuning in to another episode of The House List. I just marked your name off. You're all up in there now. Enjoy your night and enjoy this one. All right. Peace, y'all. I'm out of here.